Ten years ago this month, on June 29, 2007, iPhone was released. Within just three months, Apple had sold one million iPhones. Now, a decade later, more than 1.2 billion phones have been um, sold. How did iPhone come to be? Tonight, four members of the original development team will discuss that uh, Apple secret project, which in the past decade has remade the computer industry, changed the business landscape, and become a tool in the hands of more than a billion people around the world. This program is part of iPhone 360, led by the Exponential Center here at the museum. And the goal of that is really to do what we do here at the museum, to explore and tell the story of transformational technology and how it's affecting all of our lives through technology, through business, and through social impact. And in the spirit of that 360 approach, we're telling it from many people's voices, uh, from many perspectives. And we hope that the setup tonight in this 360 in the round, that perhaps you'll hear the stories tonight and think about this story from a new perspective. Throughout the year, we've been exploring this iPhone 360, not only through public events, this is the third or fourth in the series, but also through collections, through artifacts, through oral histories, developing new research, uh, creating a new exhibit, uh, and uh, publishing insights and creating new educational materials. That's at the heart of the mission of the museum. If you're a part of the story and can help us capture the story of iPhone or tell it, um, please be sure to contact me or a part of our curatorial team. Many of them are standing in the back. We have an amazing team of curators and project members that would love to talk with you. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers for tonight's program titled, Putting Your Finger on It, Creating iPhone. First, John Markoff, who will lead tonight's conversations. John was a Pulitzer Prize-winning uh, journalist at New York Times, where he covered business and technology, and uh, has been a well-respected uh, author on several books. At the beginning of the year, he joined us here at the Computer History Museum as a historian, and he's a member of the iPhone Project. Please give John a warm round of applause. Thank you. Our first panelist, and to introduce our panelists, I'll bring up uh, five numbers. 1985 was the year he launched his first startup in the UK. 12 was the number of phones that he owned in just three years before joining Apple. 120 million, the number of iPhones manufactured during his tenure as hardware manager. Five, the number of years he worked at Apple and 27, the number of hours he spent on his longest day in the factory. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Hugo Fines. <laughs> so glad to have you here. Good. And for our next guest, 10 was the age when he first used an Apple computer. Three was the number of platforms that Apple supported in 1993, his first year at the company. 19, the number of years he worked at Apple. 17, continuous years running the pre-release operating systems at Apple. <laughs> and 30 plus, the number of operating systems released that he contributed while at Apple. Please join me in welcoming Neeton Ganatra. <laughs> Thank you so much, Neeton. Thank you. And now to round out our panel, 10 was the grade in which he made his first software demonstration. 110, the highest speed in frames per second contacts could scroll on the original iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> 16 years at Apple and 58 seconds, it was less than a minute, 58 seconds, the fastest time code turnaround during a human interface review. <laughs> And about 45, the number of amazing teammates he said he was privileged to work for, work with, and platform experience. Please join me in welcoming Scott Hurst. Thanks, Scott. Hey. In 1991, uh, Mark Weiser, who was then a computer scientist at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, published an article in Scientific American in which he argued that Computing was beginning or was about to disappear into everyday devices and they would become magic. 
And for me at that time, it was both an alluring and really foreign idea because I was just getting used to the last big concept in computing, which was that computers would become personal. Um, the, the, the sort of the best example at that point was an idea that had been created by another Xerox computer scientist, Alan Kay, the Dynabook, and the idea was that you would have one computer for one person. And um, all of a sudden, computers were about to go away. But like the Dynabook, which preceded the first useful com you know, portable personal computers, it was about 15 years. And the same thing ended up being true with this idea of ubiquitous computing. It took about 15 years. And I'd sort of like to make the argument that it was the iPod, in which a microprocessor disappeared into a music player, and then the iPhone, in which a phone was blended with a microprocessor and it became magic, were the sort of first two successful um, examples of this new um, era of ubiquitous computing that we're deeply into now. Um, so with that in mind, let's explore how it came to be. And I'd like to start um, by asking you guys uh, about, there's sort of a tale of, of uh, which I guess I'd call the invasion of the body snatchers, about how this got going. And I'd, I'd like to... Um, uh, have each of you describe how you came to the iPhone project. Um, how were you recruited in? Um, how did each of you arrive at? Hugo, do you want to do you want to start? I, I, they had a couple of attempts um, in in 2004. I came over to the US and interviewed, and they wouldn't tell me what I was working on, which is quite normal. Um, uh, uh, and I, I decided no, I, I wasn't going to do it. That two years later, they came back. And said, so it's really cool this time, <laughs> really cool. Um, but they couldn't tell me what it was until I left my country, left the UK, moved to the US, signed another NDA. Um, uh, and I, I was very glad I'd done that. I, I, but it was... It was, uh, was that a big deal? Did you... Was it... I mean, it was, was a big deal leaving the country, yeah, uh, and coming and working on a project that I didn't know what it was going to be. I'm pretty sure it wasn't going to be a photocopier, but... <laughs> um, I, we, we, we interview, when you're interviewed a lot of ex-Motorola people, it's like, huh, huh, radio, huh, hmm. <laughs> and, yeah, everyone had been talking about phones. They'd, you know, they'd been the rumors for years. You were a processor guy at this point. Um, no, I was uh, actually an MP3 player guy, actually, but competing with iPod. So, you know, I, was, I, was, <laughs> I had a startup in 98, was acquired by Rio, and, you know, I'd actually met Tony Fidel, I think, in, like, 2003. Okay. Um, we had a technology meeting about Apple maybe buying some IP from us, and that's how we, and it was just like, oh, him. Okay. Um, and, and I think that's how they kept on calling me. So I was lucky I, I did actually say yes, otherwise. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Nitan, how did you, how did you get recruited in? Um, so I had already uh, been working at Apple for 11 or 12 years by then. Uh, I was working in the operating systems group, uh, and I was managing the, the mail and address book teams for Mac OS X. And it was just a just matter of course, just sort of during the day, we would talk about electronic products that were out there. And, you know, this is early 2000s. And uh, there, there was some development happening on, on phones. And anytime somebody, somebody uh, received a new phone or something like that, we'd pull it out and play with it and look at what was neat and look at what was terrible. And a lot of it was more terrible than neat. Um, so we just had these hallway conversations. Uh, it, and, and it just so happened that Scott Forstall was in the office next to me. Uh, so he would participate in these conversations as well. I'm not, I haven't heard from Scott. I, I, I'm not sure how much that played into what would happen later. Uh, but, but one day Scott did walk into my office, close the door behind him, and, uh, and said, we're, we're going to be starting this new phone project. Uh, how would you like to give up managing the mail and address book teams and, and uh, manage uh, the the, the uh, software part of, uh, of, of this phone thing. Uh, and it was, I, I mean, it was kind of a, I mean, it was both terrifying and it was also uh, uh, amazing all at the same time. Did you make the decision on the spot? Oh, absolutely, <laughs> yes, yes. I made the decision right on the spot. Yeah, it was not but a We played it cool, like, <laughs> don't say yes right away, but. Like. And did you disappear? Is that the right way to describe it? Uh, several days later, or a couple of weeks later, something like that. It, it, yes, we, well, first of all, I mean, and I think Scott can probably tell this story a little bit more. Um, well, I was in the office next to him, oh, so, so. <laughs> <laughs> after I think he went to your office, then, you know, very quickly, you know, 
hey, you know, come and talk to me or whatever. Come, come to my office, whatever. And we'd kind of, yeah, we'd kind of like been talking about, oh, maybe there's something kind of cool going on. And I'd been on a dress book, and one of the things that we'd, a feature that we'd done for that is like we had these like little, the Bluetooth connection to the, you know, the crummy little right. candy bar phones that you had. And so we had piles of those, usually from like, Europe always had the best ones, like our phones in this country weren't anything to like get excited about. And so when Scott was like, so what do you like about your job? I made sure to be like, well, these phones, you know, I think there's a lot we could, you know, we could do some pretty cool stuff with these phones. And then it was like, well, maybe you would want to do this. And I was like, absolutely so want to do this. Where did you go to? Where did you disappear to? So, so I think it, was, it must have been a week later or something like that. Small number of days later, we, we moved our, our offices. Uh, Scott and I and two other guys, Greg and uh, Virgil, Virgil uh, from the... Uh, from the mail team as well, we all moved up to the human interface hallway. Yeah. So we were in the, in the, uh, sitting across and, and next to uh, the human interface designers. Um, and what we didn't, what I didn't know before that was that, I mean, obviously they had been working on these projects. They, they work on lots of stuff, so you know, it's not a big surprise that they're working on more than what we knew about. But lo and behold, they had this, you know, they, they had this Macintosh that was hooked up to a tablet-like device and a big thick cable between the two and uh, and that was where we saw the first designs was, uh, that, that's where I saw the first designs was, was uh, on this Macintosh with this prototype tablet uh, hooked up to it. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and the funny thing is that those first designs look an awful lot like what the rest of the world eventually saw. I mean, there were a lot of changes and a lot of churn in between there, but. But it had that thing where it was carried. like, you know, the, the scrolling contact stuff that, that Boss did where it's just like, we just sat there like, like gaping idiots just bouncing this thing because it just like it just felt so good and you knew like when you saw it that like I, I mean I imagine this is like what people say like oh well you saw this and you knew everything was going to be that way and like I feel like when we saw that it was just like 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 this is what I, this is how everything is going to be and I if I can do something to help bring it into this world then I want to so that was 2005 yeah yes yeah okay Okay, so before we go too far, I want to ask each of you how you got into computing. Yeah, there, I think there's some interesting stories. Behind. I was a huge nerd, so um, <laughs> um, nobody, el nobody else would have me, so it was like, you know. No, what was my deal? Like, I think what I think was cool is like when I was, I was in the fourth grade, we had like an Apple II, and I was like, you know, really was into that and stuff. And I, I remember having to fill out these like three by five cards of like, well, what are you going to do from your 20s to 30s? Or what are you going to do from your whatever? <laughs> and it was like, I remember from like my 20s to 30s, I was like supposed to be at Apple. And so. This is before the Mac. This is this Apple This is the fourth TV. grade. Uh, yeah, what did I have? I had my first Mac was like a Mac Plus that my dad's office partner had to give up because he had, I don't know, he had something where basically couldn't have it at work because it was like an OSHA hazard. And so they brought it home to me. <laughs> <laughs> Nitan, how did you get into computing? Uh, I, too, was a huge nerd. <laughs> uh, I, I, it was just something that had interested me uh, fr from the first time I saw a, an Apple II Plus. Uh, and, you know, and these, these awful, now awful games, like I think there was one called Trek and some, some other games that, that uh, you know, it started with games. And then, eventually, and then over time it turned into, well, how, how, how do you actually make a game? Like, how do you... You know, did, did somebody sit down and really write this all in this basic thing that, you know, seems to be good for printing my name across the screen, but really, did people write games in this? And so, I mean, I, I think that that sort of piqued the curiosity was, you know, starting with the games and then going into basic and then learning assembly and, and just sort of learning a little bit more about, how, you know, how the Apple II actually worked behind the, behind the scenes. Did you try to write games? Uh, I didn't really write anything of, of, you know, of interest back then. I, you know, I wrote, I, you know, I wrote some small tools here and there to help me out, you know, with, uh, yeah, you know, like Spanish vocabulary, you know, that kind of thing, or, you, you know, just little things here and there, but nothing of consequence. Hugo? Obviously, I was a huge nerd as well. Um, <laughs> I, I was, like, maybe disadvantaged. You know, I, I grew up in rural Somerset in southwest England, a dairy farming area. Um, my father worked for Clark's Shoes. They had an ICL mainframe, and I, I got to walk through the computer room with clearly marked exits in case the argon fire suppression came on. Um, but uh, we didn't have a computer, so, so my, my dad would borrow a Commodore PET and monochrome one. And what I remember was it was an 8032 with a proper keyboard. But when I was typing in the games from magazines, all those funny little graphic symbols aren't labeled on the business keys. Mm. So I had to learn which function key to get like the half 
diagonal. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, I, I got into it like that. Um, and you know, pretty soon, but my dad was easily persuaded on computers. So when the BBC came out, uh, the, the Acorn BBCB, uh, we went to buy just the BBC. We ended up getting disk drives and a monitor, so I was just like in heaven. Yeah. Um, but uh, it started off with that, and I was a, a big Acorn nerd all the way through. So you know, the first ARM processors and, and stuff. I wrote the first sound tracker player on the ARM processor, which is uh, I was an Amiga guy before that, so it was cool. Yeah. But uh, it, you know, it was it was a uh, it, yeah, I think most people have the same stories about computing, really. It's just mine are in hypercard, though. They're not as, like, you know. <laughs> so, so not as, mine were in hypercard. They're not as legit real as, you know, yeah. picking, peeking and poking it, like, you know. I, I want to ask a little bit more about the secrecy involved in the, in the iPhone project. When you guys were in, what was it like outside when you went to dinner with friends, or how, how awkward was it? Friends. For you? No, no, sorry. <laughs> dinner out. That's, what, that happened, right? What was his dinner you speak of? <laughs> that, those were all in 2007, right? After the dinners with Let's, friends. No, that yeah. period between 2005 and 2007. How hard was it? To people, I mean, the thing about Apple is, like, people, they, we all get it. We all live in that culture, and we understand it, and we respect it, and it's kind of not a cool thing to be like, oh, tell me whatever thing you're doing. And so I don't know that... People do we were working on something cool, and they would kind of give you maybe a hard time about that, but they were very respectful. I don't ever felt, feel like I got like pressure to yeah. leak something to them. It's, it's interesting. You start to, one of the things I noticed was you develop a talent for yeah. describing something that you're working on without too many specifics, yeah. without giving, giving away you know, too, many, too many details, right? And so you can, I mean, there are multiple ways you can you know, tell the same story, and you can deep dive into, you know, well, these phone calls didn't work, or, you know, this text, <laughs> this entry wasn't in the database, and who the hell knows what's going on. Or you can just sort of say, well, we're adding some data to the database, and this thing isn't not, doing the thing that working. the thing is supposed to. So then if thing. somebody's paying attention, they may go, hmm, you're using a database. <laughs> that doesn't, it doesn't really it. Tell, him, tell him anything, you know. Uh, my sense is that you did better than many other Apple projects. I mean, now, today, it seems like everything Ap Apple does leaks. And it I think it's bigger. I mean, is my memory right yeah. that you did pretty well uh, keeping a lid on things? In, in hardware, we were all in one corridor, purple, right. purple corridor in the bottom floor of Mariani. Yeah. And, and, you know, there were like 15 people tops in there yeah. doing that stuff. Uh, there was no one. There was no one to talk to, and it was everyone was like, "You didn't want to let anyone down. You knew everyone personally." Right. Yeah. You and didn't you're not going to be, be that guy. And you're not going to be simply. You know those people. If you leak it, like, then you're screwing your buddy over, and like, it's not something you want to do. So. Yeah. D d purple was that the code name of the original project? And does anybody remember where the? I mean, there's been a little bit of discussion oh. recently about kangaroos and. Not a kangaroo. Parks. Not a kangaroo. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't aardvark? Know. Wasn't, wasn't there an aardvark at some That's point? That's the radar. So the radar icon, I mean, there's the radar icon, which is an aardvark anteater guy. He eats bugs, right? And then I want to say, I don't know, Andre, didn't you do the simulator icon? <laughs> Sorry. Did I say Andre? He's not here. Um, the, uh, there, was a, there was a wallaby. The, there's a wallaby, which kind of looks like a kangaroo, I guess, that was purple but I think they're kind of unrelated. I would ask your follow-on guest, maybe, if yeah. he knows like, <laughs> where that came on. So I, I also want to ask about the, the sort of the competitive terrain that was out there while you guys were involved in the project, because I, w I spent a fair amount of time in 2006 in Europe, and I had this real sense that, that, that innovation was shifting in terms of mobile computing, particularly to Europe. It really felt like, for the first time, Silicon Valley might miss the next turn. And then all of a sudden the iPhone happened and everything reset and the thing came, came, came back. What did the comp competitive terrain look like? I, I, it was, wasn't, didn't the rocker happen in like 2000? <laughs> he doesn't mean it, it's okay. So th okay, okay, that's not true. Okay. I, 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 let's, let's, so there was Palm, there was Blackberry, there was Symbian, there was some Japanese, uh, variety of Japanese things. Um, did you feel urgency? Did, it, did you feel like, you know, if we're slow, somebody's going to come to these ideas first? Not on the hardware point of view. I mean, I, I'd, been, I'd actually worked on some of the Symbian code back in, like, 98. I'd been contracting for Symbian. Where actually, Dave Tupman, my boss at Apple, actually turned out he was, like, five floors above me, and I didn't know him. He was doing hardware at, at Symbian at the time, at, at Scion. Um, 
But actually, you know, when, and, and I'd been a big phone nerd, as you could see, the number of phones I owned. I used to buy the latest release and go, this is the one, this is the one. It's going to be, oh, it's awful. Um, <laughs> sell it on eBay, buy another one. Um, and I'd been through all the different ones. And, and you looked at, no one was really pushing the boat out to what was possible. And so when, you know, came in, the specs we were doing, the, the, the speed of the processor, the size of the screen, we didn't, I didn't, you know, in the hardware team, we didn't really know. We knew it was multi-touch, but like, I, the first time I saw Pinch to Zoom was at the keynote. I didn't get to see it before then. <laughs> That's just amazing. Um, uh, you know, amazing. it's like, need to know. Does the yeah. touch screen work? Yes, we get touch events. Okay, you're, you're done. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, there was, there was a lot of stuff there, which was, you know, you looked at that stuff, and it was just like, it's obvious that everyone else was just, they had to make so many different variants of phone. There was just like incremental. They were holding stuff back. And Apple had nothing to hold back. It's just like, let's go for it. Yeah. What's the best stuff we can get? Let's add a bit to that and push all the chip vendors a bit harder and the bit screen vendors and everyone a bit harder and, and, and get this amazing thing. Um, and it was just Nokia was being incremental. Everyone was being incremental. Yeah. For me, it was more like the, like the gaming world seemed like it was starting to get it quicker than like the phone world did. Yeah. You know, back in the day, you look like I think Sony had like a, like a portable out that actually had some kind of like graphics that actually moved at something faster than 10 frames a second or something, right? And you could yeah. kind of see that and go like, you know, well, the hardware, somebody was, I mean, it was huge, but like, you know, somebody's able to make something that kind of does this for an hour <laughs> before it runs out of battery. Like it gave you some hope that we could pull off something yeah. cool. Yeah, that's kind of more like what was I happening with, with, with consoles. Sorry, with consoles were like, every time a console came out, like Sony would put so much stuff in the PS3, everyone would go, you can't possibly make money on that. There are so right. many chips in it. And it would work out in the end. But they had to, you always had to seriously, not one up, you had to two up the, the last console to be noticed. Yeah. And that's kind of, yeah. Anytime. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that, yeah, yeah, you're right, that every, every single time a new phone came out, for me anyway, there, I, I had this hope that, okay, this was actually going to be the phone that I want to use. And they never were, and and it was, <laughs> it was because they were they were very incremental. Like you know, every, you know, it's a brand new year, and Sony Ericsson now they have this brand new phone, and you know, last year's was okay, but boy, they've done a year of learning. Let's see what they come out with now. <laughs> and one year later, it's about like what they had released a, a year. Except before. it would have like a special key that did something stupid on the side of it. Yeah, like, you know. <laughs> or, or, yeah. And it was slower than last year's and probably had slightly worse battery life yeah. and had this fuzzy screen that allegedly was color. Yeah. And uh, you know, it was just, it was just <laughs> that in, in all these ways. So. so it was waiting for disruption. <laughs> so what, one of the things I don't get about secrecy, I mean, you guys talk about, you were heavily compartmentalized inside is the sense I got. And it just seems to me that that would be an impediment to making things you know, interaction, right? It, obviously, there was some way around it, but wasn't, didn't you have to get over the walls to work together? Yeah, we, we did, and, and I, I, I'm, it was an impediment. Of, I mean, I, I think, of course, it was an impediment. Um, but, but at the same time, there was, there was it, at the same time, there was so much value there as well by having this secret and having it, having it be that, you know, let the whole, let the rest of the world think that, in order to develop a phone, you have to do this incremental thing, right? You know, and, th and that's what the industry looks like. And you know, everybody's going to have effectively a dot one, and they're going to take a, a whole year to, to come out with that. You know? um, I, I mean, I think that all served us very well in the end, that you know, nobody knew what was coming, and nobody knew what, what we were working on. You know? and, and if anybody had to guess, they would think that it looked probably a lot like the Blackberries did right. at that time, or the Trios did at that time. And they, you know, maybe. If you asked anybody, based on what had already been happening in the phone industry before, they would think that we were going to have a very minor increment on top of the best phone that, that was there in 2006, right? You know, because that was the pattern that everybody else was following. Yeah. So why would we have anything better? You know, and, and so, if, you know, that, that all, you know, I think those years of, of, you know, sort of slow development in the phone industry also helped us too. In addition to keeping it secret, it helped us really make a big splash. When Steve Jobs led the development of the Mac team, um, he basically created esprit de corps by convincing them they were pirates. They even, they even flew a pirate flag at one point. Did, was there anything, how did, what, what was the, you know, the chemistry that, that sort of motivated you? Was there anything like piracy or? <laughs> Do we pillage anything? <laughs> we, we pillaged employees. From we pillaged groups. employees. <laughs> pillaged a lot of I mean, I would say that's a, yeah. Engineers. That was as close as it came, is like we, we would go 
to build, so there's building two, which is kind of where we were, and then we would wander over to building three, which is kind of where a lot of other people were, you know, to hang out because we have like friends there and whatever, and then like, like little, like iChat storms would blow through that like, those people, they're in there, you know, they're over here poaching again, like, you know, managers would come out and like, you know. Right. <laughs> I, I would walk into building three and, and within just a couple of minutes, two or three managers are coming out and they're asking, you know, who are you talking to? You can't talk to him, we need him. You know? <laughs> because, they, yeah, I mean, obviously they knew that the, la the previous three conversations I had ended up with, you know, an employee getting yanked and, and pulled onto the, into the private area, in, we, into we, the secret area. Even yeah. in hardware, we got some best resources, like, you know, be like the best layer engineer. Yeah. We, get, oh, we got Doug, and it's like, oh, I'm sorry, guys, we got Doug. He's busy, he can't help you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so there was there was tablet computing work going on at Apple, and yet you guys brought a phone to market first. Did I mean? Were, did you guys think tablet at all? I mean, did, was there anything to cannibalize? Did you? I mean, did multi-touch sort of emerge from tablet work to end up in the phone first? What, what was the history? I don't know. That's probably. Probably a Scott there. question. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we have someone answer. Stay tuned for the exciting we'll, conclusion. We'll, we'll, we'll read. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, today it all seems so natural and obvious, but there are things in that interface that I've been told you guys like died over. Um, th you, you talked a little bit about seeing it first, seeing things scroll and seeing momentum. Yep. Or seeing, I mean, a pinch or um, what were the hardest things to do and when people look at their phones today what should they look at and say you know this is this was an innovation because now it's just like the air we breathe so I, I'll start with one I can't tell you how many how many times I heard Scott Forstall going into poor Andrew Platzer's office wherever he is <laughs> right over there <laughs> <laughs> Andrew's and, and also talking, not here. Talking about <laughs> the scrolling, the scrolling deceleration, the, 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 how, how the phone, while it's decelerating or while it's, while it's scrolling, when you touch, what is the, you know, what is the behavior of, of the screen at, at any of those moments? How should all of these, you know, just very, being very specific about the details around scrolling and, and just moving through a list and, and the whole UI and how it responds to touch. If, if you... You know, if you look at phones that, that uh, or if you look at any devices that were touched before the iPhone came out, there's really this feeling that you're, right. you know, that, you, that, that you're, you, you're wearing like three gloves and you're trying to hit these tiny little buttons. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it feels very detached. It feels like you're, you're pushing something that pushes something that pushes something. Whereas with, with the iPhone, it, it not only does it respond immediately, but, but it, it does in a very natural way. And there's a lot of freaking math <laughs> that, that goes into making it work that well. And, and, and a lot of those details, too. How much compute was there? Were you pushing the edge of the computing that was available to make that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. That nah, was OK. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like, to, I mean, kind of the interesting path of it is like, so we got it working on a G5, which is like the biggest, the fastest thing we had. And we were pretty excited about that. <laughs> and then we got it working on a, like a blue and white G3. Right. And then we got it working on, and then Virgil figured out that you could super crap up uh, one of those orange iBooks and make it even slower, and we got it working on that. Right. <laughs> and every time you would optimize it, you would, different stuff would bubble to the top of being really, really slow. Um, and then what was interesting is then we started to transition over to kind of more real hardware, and you start to play with, for kind of our experience anyway, it was one of the an early times where, hey, we have this GPU that maybe isn't total garbage compared to like the CPU, which is like total garbage. Like, how do you optimize? I mean, sorry, it was probably great. Um, like, <laughs> you know, like it was the best you could get at the time. <laughs> it, it was. Um, but like, it, it you know, it started making us think like, okay, well, maybe the way to do this is not the you know the draw model that we had done on the desktop. Uh, you know, maybe like so like Harper and core animation and all that stuff came to, came, came to be where it was like, maybe we draw the, as much of this stuff as we can ahead of time and then let the GPU do its magic of like compositing everything. And once we kind of had that, it, 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 every time we moved to like a slower or close, a piece of hardware that was closer to what we were actually gonna have, we would have to kind of like re-architect things and make it faster and to the point finally where it, yeah, it, you know. So there was a Andrew GPU in the up. first iPhone? Yeah. I mean, there was actually a, 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 okay. a lim limited very limited. Lowercase G. Had yeah, yeah lowercase G. <laughs> um. And so the graphics all, 
all happened, the compute graphics all happened there at the end? The gist of the idea was that like, things like text drawing and all that stuff is just like notoriously slow. And so you do that like, on, this, on the CPU, and you basically build a layer, right? And then the, the, the GPU is really good at compositing um, compared to the CPU. And so the idea was that, like, OK, on the, you know, kind of get everything ready to go. Get the recipe for how you're going like, to composite this scene together. Do that on the CPU. And then let the GPU do the business of actually placing, you know, compositing where all those bits need to go. And then you're not sitting there redrawing all this stuff all the time, right? You can be taking your leisurely time at a 60th of a second to like, you know, you have a little more of the time. However long, it, however fast you're throwing it to go make the next layer so that you can then yeah. composite that. So it seems totally obvious and nobody noticed it at all, but the, when you reach the bottom, when you're browsing a page and you reach the bottom, it bounces. Yeah. Where did that, is that an idea and where did it come from? That's Mr. Uh, Boss. Mr. Boss. <laughs> Wait, now, so, am, am, am I, I mean, nobody thinks about it, but was that a big deal? I mean, was it, would you consider? I think it was a huge deal. Yeah, I mean, it was a big, yeah, I mean, a lot of people thought it, well, yeah, I think it was a big yeah. deal. Yeah. yeah. But it's part of the. <laughs> so, I'm being a little, you know, yeah. certain court systems think it was a big deal, so, yeah. you know. <laughs> 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 Just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. So, so What's the story of the, um, did the icons kind of move over from dashboard? Was, I mean, what, what's the, the story of the, is that? I don't remember. Did they you, move over? Is that sort of the root? Okay, we'll come, we'll come back to that. Yeah. <laughs> and how about, the, uh, is the, the, the homepage UIC, was that codenamed Spring, Springboard? Uh-huh. Did, is there a story behind? I thought they kind of bounced, and so they, <laughs> I thought it was a Springboard. Springboard oh, okay. was originally, like this thing that I wrote as a, a quickie thing, because we are we're starting to get all these like apps, and and in the demos that the HI guys had done, like they're always very, you know, it it sprung to life and it was all this other stuff. And it, like our when we were showing our apps, once we finally had apps, like it seemed like it would be nice for them to do the same thing. And so we wrote I wrote like Springboard to just do that kind of thing, and then it kind of. Well, it also, hey, we need to be able to show the lock screen, or hey, we need, and it kind of organically grew, <laughs> <laughs> as all good architectures do, awesome. yeah. um, <laughs> into um, this thing where it's like, oh, no, no, this is like a fundamental like, you know, piece of the system. Um, and I think one of, the last, one of the last commits I did was actually to pull out the, there was a 700K ping that represented the Chrome for the, when we do demos, of like, of like some phone that never actually even existed. Um, and we, yeah, that out at the last minute. Yeah. So, um, did both? Did all of you guys, uh, or any of you, work on what was called P1, the effort to do a scroll wheel? Did did you go? Were you so, involved? So I, I arrived just after P1 had oh, died. So P1 was already gone. So I, I found stuff in my drawers. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, there's actually when we did the first board bring up, you know, the, there's there's stuff wasn't ready on the first process yet, for or, you know, wasn't yeah. quite there. So we had the original interface, and it actually had the touch screen, but you could do click wheel stuff on it. Yeah. So it rendered the UI on that. But there was a lot of stuff we were doing to check the hardware work before we passed it over to, to you know, the, the guys across the street who did all the, the, yeah. the Darwin stuff. So, yeah. But there was this sort of dueling hardware. Did, did you guys compete? Were you always on the P2 side? Is that the way it, the way it worked? Yeah. Well, it's funny because, yeah, there, I mean, there was definitely two teams and there was this you know, sort of rivalry or competition or what have you. But at the same time, we, on the software side, we, we actually developed some, some core components with the intent of sharing them with P1. Um, because we knew that so, some of these pieces, we, we wanted to make sure that they were road tested and they worked well when they, when, when they worked on, uh, when, when we eventually got to P2, as was plan of record at that time. So we actually went over and, and spoke to, uh, we met with the software team the P1 software team, and said, you guys need an address book. You're making a phone. <laughs> you probably need an address book. We're making one. We're making one that's very memory efficient and very small and compact. And we really want to make sure that our, as many of our components are, are working well as uh, up front as possible to, to kind of front load the work as much as we can, because we know that there's going to continue to be more and more work as we keep going. So let's try to qualify some of these core components early on. And one way we could do that is if P1 is the first boat that's leaving, then let's get our pieces on that boat uh, and, and make them uh, ship on P1 first. So anybody who knows about the address book API, 
And if you wonder why it's in C, and what the iOS team was thinking writing that first version in C, <laughs> it's P1. Okay. Years later, yeah. I would get all sorts yeah. of like, and, no. and, and why, is the, why is all this C garbage in here? What were you thinking? It's right. Like, well, it's, there was reason. And, and actually, the, the, radio, you know, the radio part was reused. So you know, different, different AP processor and stuff, but a lot of the radio design just came over, yeah. which is good. We had enough stuff to worry about on the first P2 on M68. Then, then we had enough stuff to worry about than, than having brand new radios as well. Yeah. We had that worry later. There was also an issue that had to be resolved. I mean, there was there was there was a Mac OS coming down um, from the top, and then there was a there was a time that people talked about an embedded OS coming up. Um, want anybody want to talk about sort of how you guys? I mean, did it become obvious at a certain point that that? Well, we I mean I don't know if this is kind of good now, but like in the very beginning, like we didn't really know like how capable this system is going to be. And so we spent a bunch of time in the really early beginnings, like in that early week where we're all like moving offices and stuff, like trying to figure out like, like how do you how do you render something? Is this, are we going to take AppKit and chop it all up? Are we going to take like you know I made a I took AppKit and like started chopping at it and I got like I think I removed my second or third bit of like two bit TIFF rendering from like 1987. I was like, even if we, <laughs> even if we, it's probably still there somewhere. Um, even if like we do this, it's, we're not building a system that is, is it's, it, that captures the heart and soul of this stuff that we're seeing. Um, and so we looked at, like I did one in Core Foundation. It was kind of like a UI kit, but done with Core Foundation. And then I started like some of the early the early UI kit stuff where it was like this Objective-C kind of framework. And it was, I think, kind of clear that like that was the way to go. It was, I think it was, I don't, we probably should have been more scared about like how much work that was going to be for Platzer. Um, <laughs> but um, um, yeah. I think that's where we were at from it is, is find this nice middle layer um, and then start building, you know, from like sort of the foundation level up um, don't bring the whole Mac over, but just you know, start with what it takes to make the cool stuff that the HI guys were were doing. Um, you know, apps came later, but there was also this issue of whether you could actually use the browser as an application environment. And was was that was that was that a, a debate that ever actually? I mean, was it? There, there was definitely a debate, an internal debate about what what technology should we use? Should we use more web-centric technology for? Creating these apps because, you know, the web the web is grow the web is the web it's yeah. everywhere and and more and more people, you know, there was this thought that it, it would be easier to author apps if we if we opened up some web yeah. if we used a web tech you know web technologies and they people who were arguing for that side that was not me uh, were were saying that these things were getting better and better over over the years as well and so at some point. <laughs> and anything that you can do in native, you could pretty much do in, on, using web technologies, and we just need to be smart about it, and this is the right path going forward. Then there were other people who were saying, no, no forget all that, native, nothing beats native, nothing beats native compilation and running right on the bare metal, uh, and why are we, we're building a phone here. Why, are, why would we possibly entertain putting a web browser on a, it, it's already hard enough to implement the design as it is using native code. Why would we throw this, this, you know, this big ball of web in the middle of it as well? Yeah, um, a bag of web. And so, I'm sorry? <laughs> it's a bag of web. A bag of web in the <laughs> middle of it, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. sorry. Yeah. And uh, some of us had like, we'd done dashboard like right then, like dashboard had come out not too soon before that, and I don't know, we'd done some of that, and. It was yeah. a challenge for me. Uh, 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 you know, Sorry, we're opening old wounds. Like, like, cause yeah. we did that, we did that, and it was sort of a little bit of, I don't know, I think it should be this way, and everybody had good points, and then we, we, did, we went away, and then everybody came together and made something cool. Apple had this other OS that was lying around called the Newton OS. Did it ever get any consideration? Uh, well, I, I think our, our designer at the time, lead yeah. designer, was Gre Greg Christie, who would formerly worked on Newton. Newton, yeah. so I don't think that anything was directly carried over from it, but at least we had that knowledge, yeah. uh, and and at least one other person uh, who who had roots in in the Newton as well, and yeah. you know could tell us war stories. So there was that, but there was never that this was old serious. treasure trove of code that we could go pull from, <laughs> and, uh, you know, build something great from the. There's, there's people who've seen an ARM processor before, though. Yeah, r yeah, that's so true. You probably yeah, which yeah. is well, I'm sorry. The people who had a, I mean, ARM processor, you know, it was, yeah. it was like, oh yeah, well I can. You know, yeah. rendering can be done quite nicely. And yeah. Lots of fun stuff. Yeah. 
so the, the keyboard, um, even after you guys um, announced, I mean, it was, a, it was like a huge question mark, a huge gamble. Um, when did you guys sort of buy into the notion you could build a, a device without a physical keyboard? Well, I made the first crappy one that made everybody <laughs> consider, maybe this isn't going to work. Um, <laughs> why was it crappy? Uh, why was it crappy? That's a good question. I think because like, I had no business making a keyboard. Um, like back in the day, you look at it now, and it's like this beautiful machine learning problem, right? But then I was like, just this idiot, and I didn't, I was like, I knew what an n-gram was, which I thought was pretty cool, but not nearly cool enough. Um, and, um, but yeah, but then, we, we, uh, maybe we'll hear stories about that later, that we had like a, a competition, and really awesome ones came out of it, and so we, we shipped that. I think at some point, if, I, don't, I couldn't tell you when, it kind of felt like it wasn't as scary a thing. We were talking about, it's really hard to like, you could, that's one of those problems where you can then be really all in your head about it because it's like, well, like, on, on I type on this thing and it sucks. And if I type on a BlackBerry, maybe it's better. Um, and you, you can get in your head about, well, this, you know, this sucks and this is better. And when you're doing that math, you're not thinking about, well, that, yeah, but, but this phone does all of this other stuff that you can't even compare. Like, BlackBerry doesn't do any of that stuff. Um, you can get kind of like spun up about those kinds of problems and really kind of maybe not notice that, yeah, yeah but the overall picture is, is much, much better. We've got a ton of questions, a little bit of time, but I do want to ask one, one hardware question. While all this was going on, <laughs> um, you know, you were building the supply chain to China. And I mean, was that something that you were deeply involved in? And what was it like trying to set up a manufacturing operation in um, China? It's funny, you know, Apple was great at manufacturing already. You know, and they had a lot of the iPod people, the EPMs, EPSs, all the, all the stuff like that. I mean, it, for us working there, it was actually like all this was done for you. That was the, the great thing about working. It was like working for a startup with infinite resources, and you got top priority on everything. You know, you needed some new test gear, it arrived the next day. You know, when you design stuff, you got to pick the best chips for the best, make stuff work. Someone else would worry about cost. So it, I, it was always amazing. You know, we'd, we'd sort of fly to China and Everything, everything was organized. Everything would arrive. Processes would be like hand carried from from Korea over, and they'd, they'd arrive just as the SMT line started to move, sort of thing. And it was like, wow, someone's done a lot of organizing here. And I just turned up and like, you know, put power in and stuff smoked. Whoa, okay. <laughs> um, I'm glad I'm here to help. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> You know, there was, Apple already had this very mature manufacturing machine. You know, they, they hadn't made a phone before. They'd made lots of miniature stuff before. They'd built Wi-Fi radios before. Yeah. Sure, there were lots of different challenges, but Apple was incredible at, at designing and building it and managing that, that, that chain. I mean, there were some things we did new for the phone in terms of like a really connected manufacturing process, which was new, and there were a lot of, a lot of people lost a lot of hair over that. Um, making that work, yeah. but uh, it was great. You know, there was like there was like sovereign territory in the Foxconn office. There was like in, in the, it, there's an office which only Apple people could go into and had like direct DS3 lines from from Texas into it. And there is amazing things in the factory. How often did you go to China? Um, for the first phone, a lot, um, and and then I had kids. <laughs> and uh, and, and, and uh, uh, Apple, very nicely, my manager, let me not go as often. Yeah. Um, but I really did like going to China. I mean, China's an amazing place. I find manufacturing amazing. I find the fact that the way China works, nothing is wasted. You know, it's like if there's a room with no one in it, the lights are off. Often it's unheated and the lights are off. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes they unscrew every third light bulb. Um, but, it, it, you know, it's, it's kind of a, it, it's to see how efficient the world can be. You kind of go to China, you see efficiency yeah. because it means something there. And I think we get very insulated to that in the Western world slightly. That it yeah. I'm going to start this. I want to ask one last question. What was it like to sit in the audience at the launch during um, uh, Macworld? And, I, and were you guys nervous? What, what was I still get, um, it's, it's, yeah, I still get just now. I just get like, you know, chills about it. There's this funny, there's a, there's a Red Hot Chili Pepper song that happens the moment we hit our high water mark. And when you hear that, when you hear it play, like, we know, I know we've hit our high water mark for memory, and we're not gonna, like, <laughs> screw up. It's like, and it's like, I can be just, like, all pissed off at something, and then that song will come on the radio, on the radio and it's like my, my blood pressure just drops, <laughs> like, you know. 
It, it was absolutely terrifying. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, uh, it, it was surreal to, to see Steve Jobs demoing the, the thing that you, you've been working on for, for so many years. But, but at the same time, remember the things that he was demoing were things that we had worked on. And so, you, you know, the terrifying part was just, okay, we know that we've been through these demos and we know that we've fixed a lot of bugs in here, but there's always that chance that, you're going to, that, that he's gonna hit some bug that nobody has ever seen before and he's gonna hit it on stage during the keynote and it's gonna be in one of the things that I'm responsible for. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and so there's no amount of, of you know, making yourself feel better about that until, yeah. until the actual demo passes by uh, and, and you can breathe a little bit, but, but usually the, you know, then there's another uh, uh, app that's, that's about to be downloaded, or, or Steve goes into this grand finale yeah. at the very end, and, you know, and now we're all having heart attacks because he's using four different apps and doing five different things. And, uh, Some of it so to it the was, script, probably. It was a little terrifying. I had a diff different way. I, I'd, I'd worked on the video output board and the tethers connecting the thing. And For the demo. For the demo. And then yeah. there, there were four things on the thing, and one worked the whole way through software and hardware, but I knew the tether was only two meters long, and I was more than two meters away, so it couldn't hit me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I, I was kind of cool with the whole thing. It wasn't a problem. <laughs> I, I want to ask you guys one sort of future and a question. This has all been about the iPhone. But you know, now when I walk down the street in my home, my, in San Francisco where I live, fully half the people are looking at the palm of their hand. Yeah. I mean, really, walking down the street, it's just it's, it's stunning how you guys change the world that way. And at the same time, I always think this can't be the end of UI. There has to be something after this. You guys have any thoughts? I mean, for a while I thought it was certain it was going to be VR. Now I'm a little less certain that that's the next step. But do you see a way forward in any in any time anytime soon? I, I kind of think it's going to be ambient ambient intelligence. Essentially, you know, the surroundings will be intelligent and actively help you with your life. Yeah. Um, that's IoT. It's you know. Yeah. I I can't really guess at what it's going to be, but but I yeah I do it, I do feel like at some point UIs are going to go away. You know that, that it's that we're not going to be looking for you know graphical representations on this light up thing, yeah. you know whether it's sitting on a desk or you know in your hand or something. But I think, but at the same time, there, there's so much, so much information can be conveyed uh, through a UI or through you know through a screen that there, there's probably it, it's going to be hard to to come out with with something that's even better yeah. than than what we have today. Yeah, I don't think it'll be I don't think it'll be an all or nothing thing where it's like all of a sudden we'll be. <laughs> doing some things yeah. like I think there'll be yeah exactly I think there'll be things that are there's tasks that are really good for like displays and there'll be tasks that are really good for you know voice assistant kind of stuff and yeah. Um, yeah I think we'll just I think it'll just be ubiquitous as it w is what'll make it all work it's just like you won't have to think about it it'll just I'll go to the thing that yeah. you know helps me do this task the best okay we have a ton of questions I'm going to ask them quickly um, and one or both uh, are all answered. Uh, did you predict, forecast the app boom that would happen after the iPhone was released? If yes, what is the next boom? Well, let's, let's just start with, did, did any of you predict the app boom? Did you know that that was what was the iPhone was, platform was going to create? I did not. Uh, I did not. Apps were really sucky on Symbian, so. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I guess I kind of thought, it, I don't know. I, I know. I mean, there, early on there was, it's funny because early on when we, when we spoke about apps, kind of the, the apps that we would talk about were sort of the, 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 they were more professional in nature. Like I know we talked about Hippocrates a lot. And we talked about, you know, Hippocrates is this, yep. is this app that ran on Palm devices that doctors carried around and it has, it has a lot of medical information on it. And, and it became pretty clear pre pretty early after we, we had the, you know, sort of our, the way we addressed apps for, for iPhone 1.0 was to say, go use web, tech, web technologies, right? Go make the best web app you can and go, you know, go to your website and load it and we'll allow you, give you ways to bookmark things. And it wasn't great, but, but that was the answer. But it, it became pretty clear that there are use cases that we wanted to support, like something like Hippocrates, that uh, maybe it wouldn't really work. I mean, how is, how is that going to work offline, like in a hospital where there's probably poor cellular reception? Do you really yeah. want to be trying to ping a remote server when, when you're doing that? So, so I think early on, it started, in my mind anyway, it started as, as you know, we, we were just focusing on professional type apps, which is, it's such a funny thing to say now, especially when 
you know, the hundredth fart app came out on the store, you know, to, to think that a lot of it, a lot Some of, of them were pretty professional though. Made yeah. the platform, yeah. yeah. How, did you, how did you keep Samsung from knowing what you were doing? Actually, Samsung was in the building with us. Yeah, so, did we? You know, it was, <laughs> yeah. okay. they, they weren't allowed in, I mean, in the hardware, but they couldn't see any UI, but, yeah. you know, they, okay. they, had, they had the chips. Okay, so, yeah. that's a good answer. How many hardware prototypes were killed before the first launch of the first iPhone? Ooh, define killed. Uh, <laughs> we got through quite a lot of them, but no one wants to use the old ones. You know, Proto Zero, and when like EVT comes out, no, no, no one touches the Protos anymore. Technically, I think you're supposed to hit them with hammers and put them in the blue bins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. Have, have, uh, have there been, uh, has, has that scroll wheel iPhone uh, uh, prototype P1 gotten out into the public? Are there pictures of it around? It's pretty much not showing up yet, has it? I think a lot of that early stuff like only ever shows up because of somebody's court something something, right? I don't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Is that like court discovery or something like that yeah. or a court case? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. What role did Steve Jobs play day to day on the iPhone? That's probably <laughs> a, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean making, you know, I, I I was certainly doing my best work because, like, he might be, sometimes was lurking around the corner. So, right. like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there was a time where, like, uh, there was a time where, I don't know, somebody, we had something, somebody wanted to change or whatever, and they, like, every 15 minutes, somebody was coming to me and being like, so, hey, no pressure, but Steve wants to see, blah. And, like, after about the fourth person, I think it was, like, Venkat or somebody was like, hey, Scott, and I, without looking, I was like, you know, he'll see it when it's effing ready. <laughs> and then I, and I turned and there's, so Johnny was there and I was like, oh no. <laughs> and then like, and then Steve's kind of just pops his head through the, my door frame. It's like, <laughs> it's okay. Like, <laughs> you know, we'll wait. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> we'll be ready. That's a fair amount of pressure. <laughs> what kind of impact could individual engineers have on features in the iPhone? Was it very top down? Uh, I don't think it was very top down. I mean, I, th I think a good idea was a good idea, and I think it could come come from anywhere. And I think, to management's credit, if if you had a good idea, uh, let's do it. Yeah. 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 So no, it was not top. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. there was a lot of top down, but it was not all top down yeah. by any stretch. Why did the iPhone successfully jumpstart the mobile computer industry instead of, for example, Palm's PDA? It's kind of a softball, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know, for me, I think it's just like, it's so, I mean, I don't, you know, it's so fluid. It's so, it's, it's, it's got this magical, I mean, going back to the, you know, the rubber banding thing, it just feels, it feels lightweight. It feels like just comfortable. And um, I mean, that's just from how it, you know, from how you use it and never mind how it, it's also this beautiful piece of, piece of hardware. Right. Um, I think it's just it, you know, it checked enough of the boxes that were better, and it did a bunch of things that the other stuff just didn't even do, um, you know. Well, and I think I think also the the internet helped as well. I mean, right. I think that that when when the the Palm device was was out, there there really wasn't much in the way of of uh, of, of an internet, and and especially the utility that that people. Uh, uh, you know, over the years, that you know, the utility of the internet was just growing and growing and growing. When you had a Palm, it was really this, you know, you sync with this computer and then you're off on this little island with your Palm device and then you go back and you sync with your computer again and now you have some slightly updated information. Okay. So, so, I mean, I think it was both, both I think the desire to actually com connect to the open internet, um, but there was only that desire because there was enough utility in, in connecting to the internet that that uh, you wanted to actually do that, right? You didn't want to just, oh, I wonder what's on the Yahoo homepage right now, which is what also, you may have like, typed in 1996. Yeah. But is that really going to do anything for your, for your life, to improve right. your life if you could do that? And our web stuff was like, I mean, it was amazing. It is amazing. I, I mean, you, you sat there. I, yeah, you, you, you could have. I, I'm sure they had a web browser on that platform, but you wouldn't. You would just be, I'll go pick up a newspaper before I go deal with yeah. all of this stuff. I was going to say, I think one of the main things actually was, was previous to the iPhone, there was, it was data cost money and they charge you a lot for it. And then True. having the unlimited, it was like, oh, I'm paying for it anyway. I can do anything I want. 
Yeah. And so A, a real application platform that, that would, you wrote real code for. It was big enough that you could write proper, proper big engineered programs, not just like, how like, can I make this thing to fit into the RAM? Um, you had great graphics. You had memory. You had a fast processor for the time, but a big screen to drive. Um, but you had unlimited data. And I think yeah. that was absolutely crucial. You mean through Wi-Fi? Uh, no, 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 even, like, no, even on, it was unlimited. I mean, the early, the early phones iPhone. were... Like I think I don't know I think like I people still like have it. Get over two G. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me ask a couple a couple more questions. We're drawing it near the end of our first hour. What were early disagreements about design that Steve Jobs weighed into? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll we'll pass. Sure, on. there weren't any. Probably went great. <laughs> Okay, that's a more general one. Um, I'm so glad I have a front row seat for when Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Here's tandem questions. If you have to add one feature to the current version of iOS, what would it be? If you have to remove one feature from the current version of iOS, what would it be? <laughs> I want better text selection. Yeah. I want better, I feel like a big, word, people seem to be chasing sort of this proness, and I feel like what's, What's missing is just doing sort of fiddly delicate things. I don't know what that looks like. I don't have a, an answer, but it's like, I feel like if you made it easier to do some of that stuff, that would be pretty yeah. great. Scott talked about um, interactions with Steve Jobs. Do either of you remember interactions, particular interactions with Steve? The, the one that sticks out in my mind that's sim similar to, to Scott's story was, uh, so we were in this lockdown area and uh, we had this couch that was right outside of my office. And because we were in this lockdown area, it was pretty easy to just talk freely. And, you know, and, and it wasn't a, you know, you, people were eating or complaining about some bug or th talking about how to fix something or what have you. And it wasn't uncommon for people to be sitting there and, and just chatting uh, while I was in my office. And, you know, I'd poke back out and talk, go back in, do a little bit of work, you know, kind of do, do this thing back and forth. One night, uh, so, so we're doing this. There are, there are two or three people sitting on that, on, on that sofa, uh, and we're just shooting, shooting the breeze like we, like we normally do. And all of a sudden, it got really quiet. Uh, but I heard, I heard you know, some the guys on my team who were sitting on the sofa, but they were talking very quietly. And, they were, and, and the way that they were talking was, it was as if they were telling somebody where somebody else was sitting. And to me, it all, it all just struck me as very odd. You know, I, was, I had been beavering away on my computer, and, but I was listening to this. And a couple times I said, who, who is that? They shouldn't be, anybody who is in this area should know everybody who, you know, everybody who's in this area. Like, this doesn't make any sense. Why would somebody be asking where, if you're in the lockdown, you should already know where you're going, yeah. right? Was kind of my thinking. And so I turn around to come out and say, like, who the, who the hell is, what, what's going on here? And, of course, Steve Jobs is standing there. <laughs> uh, and so it, and I think I did, you know, out, I think I, you know, actually did say, whoa, you know, <laughs> <laughs> before answering, where, you know, the... And then who are you? Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> before walking him down the hall to the person's office who he was looking for, so... Do you have any Steve memories? Uh, I didn't have many direct interactions. I mean, I, I had, there was one request that came through. My manager was, was on the first one. We were, they were thinking, they loved the, the board. They thought it was really pretty. They wanted maybe, they were gonna have it in the, they were gonna show the PCB, which was the first time ever to show, and there was a request about moving the CPU a couple of millimeters to the left to make it symmetrical. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, it was, but it was with a proviso of, this is not gonna happen really, because I'm sure it's there for a, a real reason. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like the PMU took the other route, anyway. <laughs> but but uh, th there was a, a tiny bit of that, um, and we had a, a bit of this wasn't a Steve Jobs bit on, on the on the uh, on the iPhone four when they, they had the pretty picture of the that they did show the PCB and they had the A four processor, except they'd labeled the PMU because the processor was on the other side of the board, <laughs> and it was like it's much bigger than that. And it, but you know we engineers were laughing about this. It was a beautiful, beautifully done photo though. I'd say very nice photo. <laughs> Mark okay, always I, does an awesome job of that stuff where it's like you work on something and then they'll come up with some just amazing, beautiful animation for, I remember the original website that had like for how our sensors work. And I was like, that just looks like the goddamn future. Like what is going on up there, <laughs> you know? So uh, a, a final question. It's a little bit of a softball, but it's, it's uh, at the time, did you, and I'll say, did you think we'd still be using iPhones today? 
at the time of launch? How confident you were you were you were creating a platform that was going to be one of the major platforms of modern? I thought computing? it was. I thought it was pretty cool. I guess the thing that I've noticed is it just it feels like the 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 pace of these things is getting faster and faster and faster. So it's like I don't know. We you know classic kind of lasted this chunk of time, and then Mac OS X, and it seems like we the next thing kind of comes like faster and faster and faster, and I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I don't know what it is. I'm excited for whatever, yeah. you know, replaces this thing. You know, I, I wasn't I wasn't sure of the iPhone's future. At, you know, even even despite this this big splash and and uh, and and the great reception it received, th there are so many stories in technology about either great technology or a really cool product that's just killed for some other reason. You know, it's either priced too high or it's, you know, it doesn't solve some critical problem that, you know, some customer base needs or it's too early to market or it's too late or, you know, usually it's too early. You know, th those types of things that, that it wasn't, even though we, we had what I, something that I was just so proud of and, and, and was just something that I personally wanted to use in the worst way, it still wasn't, cl you know, clear to me that this was going to be a commercial success. I, I still hadn't completely bought off on it, probably not until the iPhone 4, probably not until the Verizon deal. Uh, that, that was sort of the first time that it felt like, okay, this thing actually, people, people still want it. It's not just the hardcore Apple, you know, the, the, the Apple fans who, who are going to buy this and then nobody else, right? It, it, that was, at that point, it sort of, it started to feel more like, okay, this is really, this is going to, going to be around in 10 years yeah. even, you know. I think just, just seeing people use it when you had got the first one, when you could actually give it to people, they could yeah. touch it. Yeah. Um, seeing the look on their faces and how they interacted with it, it was just like, well, this is the future. I was just hoping that Apple wasn't going to be the niche provider of it, you know, with the stuff for the, the people who yeah. really like good stuff. Right. And, and, right. You know, and it, it's still, the, it's not the majority of phones out there, but it's, yeah. uh, you know, I, I think it, it did inspire a lot of stuff. Okay, at this point, we're going to have a short video intermission, but please join me in giving a hand to Hugo and Nitan and Scott. What an amazing first panel. I hope you enjoyed that conversation and these videos that took us back in time, not only to 2007, but even earlier to when Steve was talking about his vision, one person, one computer, and making it very personal. It's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker for the fireside chat. First, we'll bring up John Markoff back here as moderator. <laughs> Isn't he phenomenal? And for our next speaker, five numbers. A billion plus iOS devices sold to date. 70 billion, the number of dollars paid to developers of apps in the App Store. 200 the number of iPhone-related patents he's listed on as an inventor. 18 Tony nominations for two Broadway shows that he's produced. <laughs> and six, the number of continents he's visited in the last six months. Wait, there's one more number. And one, by the way, he's only been attacked by one shark. <laughs> um, we're very proud and pleased uh, that he's agreed to speak for the first time in five years in public about the iPhone. Please join me in welcoming the original iPhone software team developer, a leader, Scott Forstall. Thank you so much, Scott. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I absolutely have to start by asking about the non-computer numbers. L let, let's start with Broadway. Um, how did that happen? Uh, I have always loved the theater from the time I was a kid. I used to act. Uh, and in fact, my wife and I started dating when acting together. Uh, and so it was always a passion of mine. When I had kids, it turned into a passion for them. Uh, they are phenomenal actors. Uh, and so we've we go to Broadway, we see a lot of shows. We go to England, we see a lot of the West End. When I left Apple, uh, I was at a friend's birthday party and I was introduced to a woman there uh, I had met before and we immediately hit it off. I knew nothing about her. Her name's Carol Shornstein Hayes. And by the end of the evening, we're best friends. 
and she said, we should produce something together on Broadway. <laughs> I thought, well, I haven't done that before. Um, turns out she has. Uh, to the tune of like 10 Tony Awards. Uh, she owns The Current up in San Francisco also. And so I said, I'd, I'd love to, Let, let's, let's do it. So she started sending me scripts. And uh, Fun Home was one of the early scripts she sent me. And I read it, and I was immediately touched by it. I mean, it's a powerful story. It's the, it's the true life story of Alison Bechtel. And her coming out in college, her father living a closeted life and then committed suicide. Um, you know, happy, uplifting uh, musicals for Broadway. <laughs> uh, and, and you read this, and it's just the emotion that it, that it describes and communicates with the audience was, just blew me away. And so I wanted to be a part of it. And I said, I want to make this successful. So we uh, do it off Broadway. We start moving it to Broadway. Um, I, find, I start finding out things like it's the first musical in the history of Broadway about a lesbian. This is a barrier that should have been broken well before 2015. Yeah. And, uh, and so I knew it was important, but a few days before we opened, right before dress rehearsal, I was, I was in the theater in Broadway, and I was downstairs in the bowels of it looking at all the technology, and actually there's all these like, lifts and a lot of technology in service of art. Not for technology's sake, in service of art. And I came up and I walked out the door, and there was a woman standing there uh, who was buying tickets. Our ticket booth was right next to the exit. And she had these four tickets in her hands. And she said, wait, you're coming out of the stage. You must be um, related to the show. And I said, yeah, I'm you know, one of the producers. And she said, I have to tell you my story. My story is just like Allison's. I grew up in a rural town. I was closeted. I came away to college. I came out. Uh, I've lived in New York City for 20 years. Uh, I have you know, a long-term partner. I go to every Broadway show, and I've never seen someone who looks like me on stage. And like five years ago, I started thinking, there's something wrong with me. People don't like me, or people like me, because there's never someone like me on stage. And then I saw that Fun Home was coming to Broadway. And so she said, I rushed down here, and I bought these four tickets. And she said, these two are from our partner and me, and we're coming opening week. But these are the two I'm really excited about. So these two tickets, I'm flying my mom in a month into the run so I can sit in a Broadway theater and watch someone that looks like me on stage and have my mom know that I'm OK. Yeah. Yeah. That's the kind of power that Broadway can bring. And so it was great. And then we uh, last year produced the first show in the history of Broadway uh, written uh, with a, uh, a women's team for the creative team, so a woman writer, a woman director, five women of color, the actresses, an amazing show called Eclipsed. Will you do more? Absolutely. This is, this Absolutely. Is, or are you I, doing I, more I, now? I, I, I'm reading scripts all the time. Uh, I'm looking at different shows. Yeah. And are there any parallels between designing software and designing Broadway plays? Uh, it's exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of black turtlenecks. <laughs> uh, I, I bet you, you know, did. doing a show actually, every show is like a startup. I mean, every show is like a startup. You, you start with the creative types, you invent something out of whole cloth, you put a bunch of money and effort and time and your life behind it, and you give it out to the public and you hope it's successful and they decide. Yeah. It's very much like a startup. Yeah. You just lose money almost always at first. <laughs> Sometimes can make money in a start. Uh, do you feel as nervous on the opening night as you did when you were launching the iPhone? Uh, there's no demos. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. when we launched the, the iPhone, that was, that was quite terrifying. I, I did not sleep. Um, I stayed in San Francisco so I could sleep and not have to drive up early in the morning, and it, it was pretty worthless. Um, but uh, every demo worked perfectly. Demos are, are very scary, but uh, it, they're exciting. I mean, you yeah. want to see the real thing. Yeah. I, you know, you can't get a... I, okay, uh, six continents and, uh, and one shark. I'll bite. Oh. <laughs> you got, you can't, you got, you, we can't introduce uh, that without... Yeah, this is a terrible story to tell because I've been trying to find more friends to go uh, scuba diving with, and this is going to hurt that. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I was down in the Caribbean recently, and I've been learning how to spearfish uh, lionfish. So it turns out lionfish are these extremely poisonous fish with tentacles. They're, they're or these spines, they're not supposed to be in the Caribbean. Um, it's come down through Florida, and they're taking over the reefs, and they, they eat all the native fish, and they move on and decimate the next reef. So there's a process where uh, people are trying to, to kill them uh, and control them. And so I was down there spearfishing, trying to get these. And we caught a really big one, and we cut it in half and fed half of it to a, another uh, sea creature. And then we were on looking for grouper. The idea is you teach grouper to eat them, and then they'll get an appetite for it, and they'll control it themselves. So we're looking for grouper, and suddenly, here comes a shark. Uh, and it is mad. It is like riled up, and it's bumping against us and scraping us with its sandpaper skin. And uh, you know, it turns out we've dumbly been chumming the water with this half cut up fish. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but I'm a photographer, and so I have this huge housing. It's an amazing aluminum housing with a big acrylic dome and these uh, huge flashes. And I'm looking through this eyepiece, and I'm like, this is awesome. Like, I'm getting great shots. <laughs> and I'm taking these shots, and it's going around. It's going to leave, and then it, it finds the, the lionfish and eats it right off the spear. And I'm like, this is great. And then it turns to my brother, who's taking video, and I think, I'm about to take a picture of a shark um, eating my brother's leg. Because <laughs> it goes, and it ducks down toward his leg. So I click the picture right before it's about to bite his leg off, Great shot. Uh, <laughs> and and the, the flashes go off, and it, it startles it. And it turns, and it comes at me. And again, I'm like, these are great shots. Like, I'm just taking these shots, and it's coming right at me. And it's 15 feet, 10 feet, 5 feet. I'm looking through this eyepiece. And, and again, I have this big aluminum housing that can go down to 280 feet. So it's strong. And suddenly, I notice that I can see the shark's teeth on either side of the camera. <laughs> uh, and it comes down on my camera. And it sends me into a backspin. Luckily, my regulator stays in. Uh, and now I realize that was dumb. Uh, I am very slow. And uh, find my brother, and we swim off. And we find a cave, and the cave has a chimney. And we swim through the chimney, and we do our safety stop and get into the boat. And I, and I looked at this, and it's, it's, it's damaged my, my very expensive, nice casing. I've already forgotten that it saved my hands. Uh, and I thought, this is terrible. And I thought, wait a minute. So I went home, and I found the last in-focus picture of the <laughs> shark. I printed it out. I cut it into a circle, and I mounted it in my housing. Uh, and that hangs in my living room uh -huh. as the greatest picture frame of all time. Because <laughs> you see its teeth, and when you walk up, you see the teeth marks of that on that and housing. You completely lose the camera. Uh, the, how, it didn't actually um, puncture enough wa uh, for enough water to get into ruin it. So I was out there with a 5D Mark III the next day, yeah. just a different housing. Okay, back in the water. So yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's, you gotta so do. I also want to ask about your path into computing, but I want to back into it. And I, I realize you went to Next in 1992, and I was thinking about that, and just in the grand scope of history and stuff, that was probably not the year I would have picked for someone to go to Next. I'm very slow. <laughs> uh, I, I was graduating uh, my, my master's. And there were two places I was deciding between, uh, Next or Microsoft. I'd worked at Microsoft in, for internships during the summer. Uh, and I mean, Next, I looked at Next, I thought, it has incredible people. I will learn a ton. It has amazing technology. I will learn a ton. It has no customers. <laughs> uh, hopefully, I'll get paid. Uh, and, and I was designing that. And I mean, my actual interview at Next was funny because I, I went in the morning, very first interview of the day. I'd been there 10 minutes. Steve barges into the, the interview room, grabs the guy that's interviewing, and takes him out. And they have this very animated conversation in the hallway. And I sit there waiting. And then the door opens, and Steve comes back in. That guy is not there. Uh, <laughs> that was not on my list of people <laughs> interviewing me. Uh, and he starts peppering me with all these questions. I'm answering them, and answering them. We actually kind of uh, we, we clicked. And 15 minutes later, he looks at me and says, 
I don't care what anyone says the rest of the day, we're giving you an offer. <laughs> Pretend you care in the interviews, though. <laughs> and, and, and then he said, uh, we're giving you an offer, and I know you're going to accept it. <laughs> like the whole mind meld thing. Uh, and, and so I got this offer from Microsoft, which, uh, so I, I turned Microsoft down. The next day, I opened my apartment door, and there's a box there, and I open up the box, and it's a very large dead fish <laughs> from Microsoft. Wow. And I know this because there is a return address. Uh, <laughs> one, Microsoft, one Microsoft too. away, yeah. it's from them. And I called up the recruiter, and I said, um, you know, I've watched movies about the mafia. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's and intense. I turned you down, and I, I, I just got a dead animal on my door. Um, That's intense. What the hell? <laughs> uh, and they said, no, 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 no. We, as soon as you turned us down, we just thought you're missing everything about Seattle. Oh. So we rushed down to the Pike Place Marketplace to throw the fish around. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they bought the largest king salmon <laughs> they could find, and they packed it in ice, and they overnighted it to me thinking, like, I will clearly change my mind <laughs> because there are no fish in the Bay Area. Uh, so oh, that's I, I, I did barbecue it that night, and it was great, but I still accepted Steve's that's offer hilarious. as he requested. So alternative history, if you had gone to Microsoft, what would you have done? Uh, there's a few things. Uh, I mean, I've been working on the desktop publishing software there. Um, and there was some multimedia video stuff that I'd looked at. Uh, Microsoft and there was, was some, rocking and rolling. Research like, place, what? It was, Microsoft was rocking and rolling. The research group had just gotten... They were, but they were doing great. Yeah. I think because I'd worked there as an intern, I had this idea that anywhere you work in engineering, you're going to do great. Yeah. And so like, everyone at my, Microsoft, those were my friends, like they're all millionaires and buying you know, fancy stuff. And I'm going to school and I can't pay for school. I'm taking loans out. I'm like, I can go anywhere. I'll go to Next. Of course, it'd be great. And it's like... Yeah. yeah, we're going public in Q plus two, and, yeah. uh, and we haven't always made payroll. But uh, it, was, uh, it was interesting. So your dad was an engineer, but he wasn't a computing guy. Is that right? Right. He was mechanical and industrial. Yeah. But what, so how did you get into computing? Uh, unlike the previous panel. Uh, <laughs> you were not a nerd. <laughs> I, I, I didn't think I was at first. And, and my brother, my older brother, he loved computers. And so one year, he convinced my parents to take his, his birthday and Christmas and combine those, plus like every relative who'd ever passed away, all the money he had, and get him a computer. And they got him a, a TRS-80. And he would sit there and program in his room. And I, hey, I was like, I, I'm never going to do this. I'd go out and I'd build tree forts. Uh, and then one Saturday he was gone, and I snuck into the room, and I found this Byte magazine, and I, they have these programs you can type in. So I typed something in, I made it run. I was like, this is amazing. Like, you can just type in these random words, and it does stuff for you. That's pretty cool. So I went to school, and I checked out um, a couple books on computing, uh, on programming, and I learned those. And I read this article about Alan Turing, who's always been one of my idols since then. And it talked about the Turing test. And so I sat down, and I wrote. Uh, sort of an early version of Eliza. I, I wanted to write something that would pass the Turing test with my friends. And that was great. And then, I guess I was disruptive at class because uh, suddenly they had come to school on Fridays and they wouldn't let me in anymore. Uh, and another bus would come and it would take me to the naval shipyard, which is not natural, by the way, when you're uh, <laughs> in seventh grade. Right. Uh, and and I programmed uh, to simulate sort of structural integrity questions for aircraft carriers, uh, which seems very wrong because I knew nothing about this. Uh, but they were I could program, but these like 40, 50 year olds would explain the math to me, and I'd program the math, and, and then uh, I'd write the programs, and they'd test it on like one thing that they had done by hand, and then trust everything else worked perfectly. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I be, be nervous if you're in the Navy. Because um, my next job, then when I was in high school, I worked at the Naval Undersea Warfare Engineering Station writing um, software for weapon systems of Trident nuclear submarines. Okay. Uh, which, again, isn't not, like if you're in high Did school. Did you have to get a clearance? Yeah, yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> you can't really talk about it, but here's what I can say. Uh, when that happens, 
feds, people who wear suits, um, go to all your friends and teachers' house yeah. uh, and ask them questions about you. Yeah. And you cannot tell them what's happening. So <laughs> when you go to school and your teachers look a little flustered when that you walk into class, that a person in a suit came and asked a lot of questions and you know, maybe having a gun, um, you can say, like, well, you just don't mess with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're on my side. So, so uh, <laughs> did you learn Ada in high school? I did learn Ada at, when I was working um, on the, 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 <laughs> the nuclear um, That could have sent systems. you back for years. It was, yeah, yeah. It was, I mean, it's, no, it's an ideal thing. You go to this place where they give you the most computing power you ever want. Yeah. Uh, and you can use it for as long as you want uh, and do whatever you want. And, and, and you can, like, oh, I need a $10,000 this. And they're like, just write it down. And you write it down, that thing appears. I mean, it's like Amazon uh, <laughs> for, like, technology. And it was, like, free, paid for by you know, taxpayers like you. Um, and you're guarded. Uh, Tw the whole time I was there, I was always guarded by Marines with attack dogs and semi-automatic weapons, uh, which sure. is exactly how we protected the iPhone later. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so, so um, what, did, what was your role at Next when you first got there, and what did you build? Were, were you on the Next OS initially? Uh, I was. Uh, I, I did whatever they told me to do. Uh, I worked on the user interface frameworks. Uh, we called the app kit, later became I mean, sort of the basis for Coco Touch, yeah. later for the iPhone. Uh, but yeah, I worked on designing widgets and drawing mechanisms for the base frameworks. Yeah. Did it get you into design right from the start? I always loved design. I, I always had a passion for design, and this allowed me to work on things that had a user uh, facing point of view. Yeah. Uh, so I, I loved that. Now we were working on. I was working on applications, so I was working on, you know, it's, it's the widget, it's the drawing thing that's used by everything, but those all have to behave well so the user can figure out what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, was that, I mean, is that where you learned your UI at, you, you had, had you studied it at all at Stanford? Well, at Stanford I took this, I did this major called Symbolic Systems, yeah. which is like philosophy, psychology, linguistics, computer science, there's concentrations. There's an HCI concentration. I took classes in that. I actually did an artificial intelligence concentration. But I took design classes yeah. uh, and always loved it. But yeah, I learned a lot by being around other designers. Um, I've also you? always done photography. I mean, there's a, there's Did you cross paths with Terry Winograd while you were at Stanford? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had, I had several classes from yeah. him. He's a brilliant, amazing guy. He'd made his HCI switch by then, probably. At a certain point, he left AI. He was AI. doing HCI, yes. Yeah. Yes, when I was there, he was doing HCI for Symbolic Systems. Yeah. yeah. Neat. Neat. So when Steve sold, what, 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 were you in the loop when Steve sold Next to Apple? How did you hear about it? What, what? Uh, so several questions there. I, we were in the loop in that uh, we kept on trying to pivot. And again, we had great technology, but not you know, you know, customers. Hey? Yeah. Uh, and so, so at some point, Steve decided, Apple, they need us. Uh, I mean, I've been looking, I cared, about, I cared about platforms. I always cared about platforms, and so I uh, was trying, you know, really wanted to this platform, we wanted developers out there, and we needed to be something other than Next to have that. Um, but Next, again, incredible set of people. I learned so much. When we started talking to Apple, and they were already like in deep conversations with B to buy B, and they put those on hold, uh, we would provide stuff, mainly uh, Avi Tavanian, who uh, you know, brilliant, uh, has a whole PhD in mock. Like he's the ideal person. He probably did the most uh, meeting and giving demos uh, of this, and we would help out however uh, they'd ask us to. Yeah, yeah. So um, you came to Apple. Were you, was Carbon something you did very early on, or how? how that, that took a little while. Actually, the last part of your last question, the way I heard was we were all sitting at Next in a big conference room. It was late December. It was uh, 96. Uh, and I had a plane to catch, and I sat there, I sat there, and I was like, I gotta hear this, and Steve's down there trying to hammer out the very last details, and finally I had to go to the airport, I got on the plane, and for the only time in my life, when they had those, those uh, phones on the plane, you could swipe a credit card, and it would just like empty your account. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I sat there listening uh, to it, and, and probably by the end of the hour-long <laughs> thing, I was like, well, my stock just paid for this call. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was very exciting, and I came back. So yeah. when I came back, then at, at 
at Apple, again, I, was, I cared about platforms. And so I started sort of traveling the world, giving talks, trying to convince developers not to give up on Apple. I was looking at making our software easier to code to, so converting some of it to Java or giving Java APIs to it, just doing something to, to keep that happening. And then at some point, I think I was in Japan, Steve took over, uh, and uh, I got something saying, you know, come back, we need an OS strategy. And so we sat down with Oppie and Bertrand and, and a bunch of others and came up with this idea. I mean, Apple had gone through many different OS attempts. You know, there's Taligent and Pink and Copeland and people in this audience, I'm sure, know way more than me. Um, and we'll start tearing up if we keep on naming them. But it was, <laughs> there was a lot. Uh, and, and we were doing Rhapsody at first, which was just take next step and put it on, on Macs. Great hardware, great software. It's not a platform that supports the apps that are currently developed on the Mac. So that wasn't going to be a great long-term strategy. Big guys like Microsoft. Microsoft and, and Adobe and Macromedia, all these folks. Um, they're just going to jettison it if you say, like, now write, you know, rewrite all of Office for this. Yeah. So we came up with this idea of Carbon, which was you could take and do a minor modification to your application and get it to run on this new OS with all of the possibilities that you wanted in it. So it, you know, it has preemption and protection and all that, but you still can write to the same APIs. And then on the side, we'll have this Cocoa thing, which is turned into the way everyone writes for, uh, for iOS, and you can write new applications there much, much more quickly. Um, but it would keep everything and move everyone along. And so then we spent a lot of time going to um, different developers and convincing them. Okay, but let's move ahead. How did you either find your way to the iPhone or how did the iPhone find its way to you? Uh, well, the iPhone uh, had a very circuitous route uh, by itself. I mean, I at that point was running like Mac OS X, um, so I ran each of the releases at that point, and uh, and we'd been working on um, a, a tablet project which has a really odd beginning. Uh, it began uh, because Steve hated this guy at Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is the actual origin uh, of this, it. And it wasn't it? Bill, because he was starting to like Bill by this point. Uh, it was uh, Laureen had a friend. His, so Steve's yeah. wife had a friend who was married to a guy who worked at Microsoft. Every time. Steve had any social interaction with that guy, who'd come back just pissed off. <laughs> and I mean, it was, in, it was not in like Microsoft's, like, you know, it was not good for them that he ever saw him. Uh, and he came back one time after seeing this guy, and that guy was talking about how Microsoft had solved computing. They solved like net, uh, like uh, laptop computing, or they were going to do laptop, or uh, uh, tablet computing, and they're going to do it with pens. And he just like shoved it in Steve's face, the way they were going to like rule the world with their new tablets with their pens. And Steve came in on Monday, and uh, and there was a set of expletives, uh, and and then it was like, let's show them how it's really done. <laughs> it's like the first thing is they're idiots. You don't use a stylus. You know it's cumbersome. You lose it. You're always like picking it up and putting it down. You, we're born with ten styluses. Style I. Style. <laughs> uh, so like, let's use the ones that you, we don't have to sell. Uh, and and so and it's like, and this this uh, at the time, touch screens were resistive touch. Yep. And resistive requires you to sort of deform the screen. You have to push it down. So if you look at it, like text and everything looks bad. It's it's really tiring on your finger. Uh, he said we need to do capacitive touch and it has to be multi touch. So we went to the hardware team and basically said like, go do this. And they started, and the design team started building designs around this idea of multi-touch. And it was pretty interesting. Uh, I remember one of the first demos of this. You walked into a room. There's a giant, giant table. There's a projector on the ceiling. And you can like, you see a, a photo or something on, on the table. And you could move your finger around the table, and it would move the photo. Yeah. Super cool. Wouldn't fit in you know, your, your bathroom, much less your pocket. <laughs> Uh, or your, your you know, bag at the time, I guess, if you're doing a tablet. Uh, but the moment you saw that, you knew this was the way to go. Like, that was, that was cool. So it was so, it, it, pretty quickly, you were sold. You thought Steve was right, that stylus wasn't the right way to go. It was, you, you saw your way forward. No question. Uh, no question. Um, I, I'd had devices with a stylus, and I hated them. Okay. 
uh, like a trio. I, I mean, like, there's cool things about it, but like you'd always lose that stylus, and you're always like you're trying to pull out, and you're typing, and then you're going back. Yeah. It was just slow and cumbersome. So, so that thing was great. Um, now, how do we get to the iPhone? A few things happened at the same time. Apple was turning from a computer company, in fact, we were called Apple Computer Inc., um, to an electronics company, Apple Inc. And I think half of our sales at the time were iPods. So we were turning into this consumer electronics company. Uh, we were always looking at what was going to, uh, what was going to take over the iPod space. Like, was something going to cannibalize music sales and, and iPod sales? And the one thing that seemed like it might do it would be phones. Everyone was starting to carry phones, and you could try to put music on your phone. Um, now, you mentioned the rocker earlier. Uh, you can do it like that, and then phones would never have taken over anything. Uh, <laughs> and I think that was like Steve had heard, you know, the razor, and the razor was thin, and uh, that's all it was. It was thin. Uh, yeah. Impossible to use, but it was thin. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and so he's like, you know, rocker, okay, it's spelled like you know, R O K R, that's cool spelling, it must be just like the razor, and it comes and it's, you know, like this big, and it's yeah. ugly, and 100 songs. So anyway, there was a thought that phones might, uh, might cannibalize sales of, of iPods, and so, um, so we thought about that. But the other thing, I remember sitting with lunch, I was sitting with Steve at lunch one time, and we were both using our phones, and we both had these phones, and we hated them. And we started talking, we looked around, like, everyone around us has a phone. And everyone looks very angsty uh, as, as they're using them. Like, no one, it seems like it's a pleasurable thing to use the phone, but it's a, it's a nice thing for communication. Yeah. And Steve said, do you think we could take that demo we're doing with the tablet in multi-touch? and shrink it down to something big enough or small enough to fit in your pocket that would be a phone size with that same touch technology. So I went back to the design team, and, uh, and they, they took and carved out a little corner of it and made this very simple demo. I'm pretty sure it was Boss who did it, uh, and Boss is, is, is one of the best. And he, he made this thing. It was a, a simple list of names. And you would, with your finger, you would drag along. It probably had the rubber banding and all. I mean, it's magical. You dragged along, and you tap on a name, and it would slide across and reveal the card. So phone number, email. You tap on a phone number, and it would say calling. It wasn't calling. It wasn't doing anything. But it said calling. Uh, the second you saw this demo, you knew this was it. The future. There was no question. This is the way that a phone had to behave. Yeah. Steve saw it and said, OK, Put the tablet on hold. Let's build a phone. Let's build a phone based on multi-touch. Yeah. And that's what we did. So immediately, the design team, we all got around and started designing the iPhone based on that technology. And the hardware team had the, you know, the Herculean task of then shrinking that whole thing down into something that could fit in your pocket. Yeah. Now, there was this other component of this. Uh, Steve famously said in 2005, we're not very good at going through orifices to get to the end user. Do you remember that? Uh, this was at All Things D in 2000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, this, is, this is referring to uh, all the carrier stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the carriers, that was an interesting thing. Um, now, I have to say, like, I came into this as a platform guy and a, a design guy, but uh, I knew nothing about phones. Like, I had no right <laughs> to, to, to lead any team doing a phone. Uh, I'd never heard of GSM or CDMA <laughs> before we started the iPhone. Uh, in fact, the first text I ever sent was on my iPhone. Uh, <laughs> and uh, because uh, texting on everything else was horrid. Um, yeah. And so we started meeting with carriers. We need some solution. So we talked about, do we do an MVNO? Do we license, you know, do we white box a carrier solution through some other carrier? Do we buy Spectrum and build out an entire network ourselves? Do we partner with one? And so we started looking at what it would mean to partner, and we'd meet with these carriers, and man, uh, <laughs> I had no idea. Uh, they, carriers at some point, realized that handset manufacturers were terrible. Uh, terrible at user interface, terrible at uh, consistency, and carriers thought they'd be better than that. 
And so they had, they would give us these things, hundreds of pages of Spec line items yeah. saying, here's all the things your phone has to do. If it's in this category, phone has to do all these things. I would look at it like, there's no way my phone does that. There's no way. And I look at the manual, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, if you do like 16 things and you do a jig, uh, you can do multi-way calling. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was unbelievable. And so we started talking with these carriers and we said, you know, we know a little thing about user design, uh, user-oriented design. And, um, and so here's the deal. You do the network. We will agree that the lowest level of our phone that talks to your network, you can give us a spec for that. Every single thing above that, you have no say. You don't even know what we're doing. <laughs> like, we're just going to go do it. You have no say. Uh, and, you know, what do you say? And like, meeting end. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we weren't really negotiating on that. And they'd say, like, well, what about this? And we're like, mm, you know, what about, like, no say, do you not understand? Um, <laughs> and, and when Singular came in, and they, they would send like four or five, six, almost always guys in suits, uh, to do, explain some of their technology. And when Singular came in, they actually, it was, it, was, it was one person, it was this woman, Chris Rennie, and she had no slides, and she sat there and she went to the whiteboard and explained stuff, which was phenomenal. I was sold right there. Like, she knew the technology well, uh, and, and they agreed. They said, okay you'll decide all the top stuff, and we'll just make sure it works well with our network. Yeah. And so they signed this deal with us. And you, and you hadn't demoed for them at that point. They didn't had no idea what you were doing. We hadn't really started it yet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 like, wouldn't it be fun to build a phone? Let's first have a deal. Um, so no, we didn't show them anything. In fact, they didn't know anything we were doing at all. And I used to like, have to kind of enjoy this, because their execs would call every once in a while with some you know, brilliant idea. <laughs> and they'd say, like, we really think email is going to be really big. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you should put a dedicated button for email <laughs> on your phone. <laughs> and I would sit there, and they don't know we're doing touch. They don't know we can update things. I'd say, like, yeah, I don't know if we'll ship with that, but maybe a few months later, we'll add a button <laughs> for email. <laughs> and they're like, oh. You're building like a Lego phone. <laughs> <laughs> like, someone can go down to the stores, you come out with new app, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and they can buy a piece, a widget, a little piece of plastic, and they can snap it on, and now it'll go to email. I was like, well, you think what you want to think. Um, <laughs> uh, and so they had no idea we'd made this huge deal. So, you know, we're going to announce it January 9th of 2007. December of 2006, we're going through creating the keynote for this, and Steve says, I think that Stan Sigmund, the CEO of, of Singular, and Singular bought AT&T and rebranded itself yeah. AT&T, but it was Singular, um, should be on stage with our announcement. That sounds great. Uh, you should probably have some idea what we're announcing the day he comes. <laughs> I said, like, yeah, I guess so. We should wait to the last possible moment. <laughs> so in December, uh, Steve and I, <laughs> board his plane, and we fly out to Las Vegas. So Stan is, is throwing an all-singular company meeting in Las Vegas. And so the two of us fly out so I can give this demo, so we can together give this demo. Uh, and so I have this, this metal locked briefcase, and I have four phones in it, and we get on Steve's plane. And, and, and so there, Stan is staying at the penthouse suite uh, at the Four Seasons in Las Vegas. And I thought, oh my gosh, like, I don't know what the cell reception is going to be there. I might get there, and it might not be great. Uh, and, and so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll do demos on Wi-Fi just to make sure. And then I realized, well, Four Seasons charges you for Wi-Fi. So I'm going to get there, and I'm going to spend the first like, you know, few minutes like, trying to type in like, a name. It's probably going to be Stan's name, because <laughs> he's in the room. Uh, and and doing credit cards, and even when you have a working device, sometimes it doesn't connect right. I thought, this, is, this will be bad if it doesn't work. So on Thursday, the day before we go, I called up the Four Seasons. Now, I can't tell them it's Apple because no one knows where we're going. In fact, we couldn't even give Steve's name when we flew. It was like I was coming <laughs> with my buddy. Uh, and, <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, I called up and I said, I'm uh, an executive at Singular, and our CEO is staying uh, in your penthouse suite, and I need to give a demo of this new Singular device, and so I need to be on Wi-Fi. 
So can you make sure that in his suite, Wi-Fi is free and open and just automatically connect? And the guy, you know, IT guy said, well, let me check back. Calls half an hour later and says, oh, we can't do that. He said, the Four Seasons and the Mandalay Bay share a single pay access point for the whole thing, including the Mandalay's Bay big, like, lazy river. Uh, if we made it free for his suite, it would be free for the whole thing. <laughs> and I said, well, it sounds like you found a solution. <laughs> and there's like, beat, beat, beat. No, we can't do that. I said, you're the four seasons. <laughs> you have the best service of any hotel in the world, and you're telling me for my CEO who's spending all this money and our whole company is staying there, you can't do this? Beat, beat, beat. Yes, Mr. Forrester, we'll make that happen. <laughs> so we fly in, and we fly in, and again, we get off the airplane, and Steve gets out first, and I'm walking behind with this, this locked metal suitcase. Uh, and they walk, the limo driver sitting on the tarmac and says, Mr. Forstall, and he's like, no, that's Scott. And he's like, come here with me. Mr. Forstall opens the door, and he walks around. And I was like, oh, my God, uh, I am so in trouble. Uh, and we get to the Four Seasons, we go up, and we walk in, and it's Stan Sigmund and Ralph De La Vega, who is now the, the CEO. And just the two of them, so the four of us sitting in there, and Stan, like, Ralph, you can see, is just like, show us, like, am I going to get fired for making this deal? Uh, and, and Stan, you know, starts like, what's the battery life? What's, you know, how, how well does it connect to the network? And, and you can just see Ralph's like, please. Uh, and, and then I answered a set of questions. And then he said, OK, let's see a demo. So I open it up. I turn on the first phone. And it instantly connects to Wi-Fi. Not a problem at all. And I go through and I give all this, these demos. Uh, they go through the roof. They are so happy. I mean, they're just like, we bet on the right horse. And like, this is the greatest. I mean, they, they in fact, Stan is a big, uh, rodeo guy, and there's like a rodeo that night, and he's like, we've been on the right horse, come to the rodeo with us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Steve made some excuse, like, I really need to get home. Uh, <laughs> so we, uh, we left. That's, that's Friday. Okay, Monday, I'm sitting in a meeting, and my phone rings, and I answered it. And it's this IT guy from the Four Seasons. <laughs> Can I please turn charging back on? <laughs> we have lost tens of thousands of dollars. <laughs> so I said, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> Great service, really appreciate it. It's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a good story. T tell me about working with Steve. Um, yeah. You were there for a long time. Yeah, I mean, Steve was a unique person on this planet. Uh, he, he was the most intense person I've ever known. Um, I mean, I've met a number of world leaders, and I can tell you from experience, having dinner with a world leader is relaxing <laughs> compared to like lunch on a Tuesday with Steve. Uh, he was super driven, very demanding. He forced people to do their best, and there's a lot of this has been told. Um, I want to tell a, a slightly different story. Um, it's one I've never told before uh, publicly, and it's he was really compassionate and dedicated to his friends and his relatives, and uh, he saved my life once. And it was it was when we were deep into Mac OS 10, right before we started the iPhone, and I got sick. Uh, my, this, this virus went through my kids' school. And everyone at school, a lot of kids at school, got sick, and they threw up once, and they, they were better. And it hit me a few days later, and I started throwing up. Once every few hours, uh, once an hour, day after day, a little more often. Steve would call every single day. What's going on? How are you doing? What can I do? Then he started coming up with, you know, solutions. Um, <laughs> you must eat this kind of apple ground up 20 <laughs> minutes at this. I mean, like, it was like very specific uh, uh, health solutions for this. Nothing worked. Um, week passed. Second week passed. I was throwing up every 15 minutes. Uh, I lost 5 pounds, then 10 pounds, then 20 pounds, then 30 pounds. Uh, I went to the hospital. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't solve it. Um, 
they finally figured out what it was, and it's a very rare thing where I think the Mayo Clinic had seen seven cases over like a decade, and most of those people died. But it was a virus. Oh, a virus that stops your stomach from working. And just certain people, like it stops your stomach. So I'm in there, and I'm dying. I'm in the hospital, I'm dying. And, uh, and Steve calls every single day, every single day, asking how things are going. If I couldn't talk, I, he'd talk to my wife. And at this point, I'm throwing up every five minutes. I just want to die. I mean, I wanted to die. They gave me every medicine they could for, that they give to people with cancer treatment to try to stop the nausea. Nothing helped. Uh, and I would sit there, like, like, holding my finger, like, wanting to break it so I could feel pain as opposed to nausea and concentrate on something else. And they put a pick line in to feed me directly through my superior vena cava because I was just, I was disappearing. And one night, about 10 o'clock at night, uh, this is now months, months into it. God. Uh, Steve calls up about 10 o'clock at night and he says, I have the best acupuncturist in the world and I'm going to bring her to you tonight and she's going to fix you. I'd never done acupuncture. I didn't have any reason to believe it would work or wouldn't work. Um, at this point, I thought if someone like come shake a stick over me, uh, into it. I'm in. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had very young kids who just saw their dad like disappearing and dying. Two hours later, it, oh, so Steve says like you're at Stanford Hospital, and I mean he, was, he said yeah they're probably not going to love me coming in bringing uh, this other practitioner into the hospital. Um, so if I get stopped, I'm just going to dedicate a wing. <laughs> <laughs> It's nice to have friends like yeah. that. Um, yeah. There was one time, a meeting we had uh, at Apple, we were trying to price something, and uh, Steve was arguing for some price, and I was arguing for another one, and he was arguing for this higher price, and I said, it's too high, and he's like, no, no, this is where people are going to pay this. I said, I have friends, I have relatives who have very little money, like, this is too high. Uh, I said, you're a billionaire, you don't understand. And he paused and looks at me and said, I'm a multi-billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked. He still went with his price. <laughs> okay, so, so he comes into the hospital um, uh, about midnight, comes in with his acupuncturist, and, and he gets through everyone, comes into my office, into my, my, office, my, my room, yeah. holds my hand, starts talking to me, and he's like, she's, she's going to fix it. And I'm, just, I'm throwing up while he's there. I mean, it's just awful. And... Uh, and she comes over and I said, does it matter if I believe this? Because I don't know if I do. I mean, I can try. Do I need to try to believe this is going to work? And she just looked at me and she said, I'm going to manipulate your involuntary system. It doesn't matter what you think. I'm going to fix you. I like the chutzpah. Uh, and she started sticking needles in my head, my back. The nausea went away. Like immediately? It immediately started going away. Yeah. She was there, they were there hours until sunrise. And for the first time in more than two months, I didn't throw up for like eight hours straight. They left at sunrise, came back a few hours later. She did it again. I never threw up again. Oh. I drove, they, they let me out of the hospital the next day. I got, she came to my house, did it. I got hungry that day. My mom baked fresh bread. I ate for the first time in two months. The next day, a nurse came uh, to, to my house and, and took out the pick line. She says the fastest in her 27 years of being a nurse she'd ever taken one out. I was 100% dying, and Steve brought this person wow. to me and saved my life. So I will always, always owe him that. That's amazing. What did the Stanford doctors say? <laughs> ah. It's interesting. It actually depended on their age. Um, people right out of med school think they've been taught the entire corpus yeah. of medicine, and they didn't believe it. Oh, you just happened to get better at this time. Yeah, so. Any doctor over 50 said, there's a lot we don't know, and that worked. Like, empirically, 100% that worked. I can't explain why. I can't tell you if acupuncture works for other things. All I can tell you is I lost 
50 some 60 pounds uh, and I threw up okay. every uh, I started like this at the beginning of that yeah. uh, and I threw up every five minutes and wanted to die and uh, this person came in and and I cling I clung on to life again yeah okay we are close to we got time I have a lot of questions All right. let's go to the questions that's that's um, where do you see the future of Siri and other AI going? This sort of gets at what I want to answer. So, so well, there's a lot of that. I mean, Siri and other AI. I mean, there's, there's Siri. There's, there's the, can you ask something a question? Like when we were doing Siri, and I was blown away by it, having had my, my master's in artificial intelligence. When I saw Siri, I thought, wait, this is supposed to be 20 years from now. Like, I can't believe it's now. Uh, and I kind of thought, you know, Google is, if you go to a library and you look up in the card catalog, what reference materials do you have related to this? And then you go and look at every one and figure out if it's right. Siri is you ask a reference librarian, go find the answer to this question. Uh, I think that sort of thing uh, is very, very interesting. And the more we can do to have that. Now, if you look at AI, uh, I, think of it, I think there's a lot we can do with AI that we're not doing right now that I hope we get to. Okay. I can talk about a few yeah. if you want, but uh, let's, <laughs> let's 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 go on. Um, how did you react to to the news of Steve Jobs passing? Well, when he was sick, I would go to his house almost every day. That yeah, was for years. I mean, he went up and down, and and I would sit at his bedside and we would talk. And some days he couldn't open his eyes. Sometimes I would just be me talking. You know, one of the things when we did, we got Siri right before he passed, and, and he loved it because he was too weak to type, but he could talk to it. Uh, it's odd to say, but I was surprised. It just felt like he would always beat it. Yeah. I mean, before his liver transplant, he was so sick. And yet he would beat it. And he'd always talk about how he's like, I don't need to beat this cancer. I just need to make it to the next lily pad. Yeah. And then there'll be more advances in science. I'll make it to the next one, and then more advances. So I was devastated. I mean, he's, I felt so close to him. We spent so much time. I talked to him more than I probably talked to my wife for years. Uh, and I talked to my wife a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was it was it was it was really really hard. Yeah, and it was funny though. See, he, the people don't realize how funny he was. He he and I would go to lunch at the cafeteria uh, at Apple all the time, and he would insist on paying. And I was like, it's, it's like you're paying me enough that I can afford the eight dollar lunch. <laughs> but he'd always like, if he got his food before, he'd wait at the line for me to get up there and he'd pay, and he'd made it so you could pay with your badge. So you'd come up there and you'd badge in, and it would be directly withdrawn from your paycheck. And somehow I was like, "Why are you? I mean, like, really? Like, go sit down. I'll be out there. I feel I feel like an ass while you're sitting there waiting for me, and I'm getting, you know, I feel like I can't get any long cooking food." And he said, "No, no, 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 no. This is great. I only get paid a dollar a year." <laughs> 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 I don't know who's paying every time I badge. <laughs> That's great. He was a multi-billionaire <laughs> scamming Apple. <laughs> <laughs> what, <laughs> what, what was the most underappreciated advance of the original iPhone? That's a hard question. What's a when the original iPhone came out, the reviews didn't get it. The reviews talked about number of clicks. Oh, to send an email, it takes you, you know, six taps or something. You have to tap into mail, you have to tap and tap, tap, tap. And so it was being compared against other smartphones at the time, Blackberry at all. Uh, according to the metrics people thought were important at the time. They didn't get it. What they didn't get was we were changing the entire paradigm. We were changing the entire way things were done. And it wasn't about how many taps. It was that 
someone who would never figure out that BlackBerry because they didn't have a law degree and a, a law firm that made them carry that crackberry around 24-7, uh, would never figure out. And that's what I think people missed. Uh, and the sales at the beginning, like, it was nice, but it wasn't what I expected. Because the first time I saw that demo, the first time I saw us you know, with a working prototype, the first time I used it, I was amazed by it. I, mean, I was blown away by it. And, and there's a question you asked at the last panel that, you know, did you think it was going to be super successful? And for me, uh, at some point, about halfway into our development, I thought, we're not using this like a real phone. We use it in the office. We don't use it outside of the office. And it's because we had all these lockdown, six lockdown areas, and you know, we had the science said fight club, because you know, the first rule of purple is you don't talk about purple. <laughs> uh, and, and I thought, we need to take this out and use it as a real phone. And so I decided, I'm going to do it. Uh, and I asked Steve, just make sure, and he said, sure, go for it. Give me one, too. And I said, not yet. Uh, <laughs> because there's all this configuration you had to do, and he wouldn't have, uh, he would have been annoyed at that point. And so I, I one day, I, I slipped an iPhone into my right pocket. I had my uh, flip phone in my left pocket, and I walked out four lockdown areas into the parking lot. And I was terrified. Uh, <laughs> I, th I, was, I was certain, like, this is the day I'm getting mugged on the way home. So I like, <laughs> around, I went to my car, I drove a different route home. Uh, I literally talked to an FBI agent about how you try to be careful and look for people um, following you. Uh, and, and, I, and I got home and I closed all the, the, the drapes and, and doors and I started using it. Uh, and I would use it all the time. Um, but I always had, you know, and only people at work plus Steve had that phone number. Uh, and so if it rang, I knew it was someone for work. I'd try to duck into a bathroom. I'd try to duck into you know, like some, you know, someone's house, into a, an empty room. And I'd pull it out, and I'd try to use it. And it never felt like work to use it. It always felt amazing. It always felt special. And so I, I knew this is going to be huge. And so months go on. I'm using it every day. Finally, Steve's like, Scott, I'm the CEO. I get to make these decisions sometimes. Uh, <laughs> You're giving me a phone. <laughs> and so probably someone in this room set up a phone for him and gave it to him. And then the two of us were the only two people in the world who were carrying phones around, iPhones around. And he'd call me up all the time. I mean, he'd be like, you know, <laughs> 11 o'clock on a Saturday. And be like, I'm at this friend's house, but they're boring, so I'm in the bathroom. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm wondering about the, you know, the, the, the touch sensation on, on photos and the way you pinch, it doesn't seem like it's quite right. And so I'd take mine out and I'd sit there and we'd be talking about it. And then he's like, oh, and I think the color of this icon is off by, you know, a little bit. And, and so we'd sit there and half an hour later, he'd be like, oh, someone's knocking at the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> they must think I'm really constipated. Uh, and he'd hang up and he'd call me back at one. <laughs> uh, and, and, but using it in that context, I mean, using it, it never felt like work. And I knew this, this is it. Like, everything is going to behave this way, and this will be successful. And, you know, pricing and other things, there was a challenge uh, to get it to the right um, business deal for a consumer to get it. But there was no doubt in my mind this was huge. Yeah. I have a, refer a friend who refers to that as Cupertino-class software. <laughs> So th this is kind of a trick question, but I have to ask it. I is that the same shirt from WWDC 2012? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> and it, when I find something I like, I buy about 10 of them. This may be that. I have many very, very similar shirts. <laughs> Would you like to buy one? <laughs> so this is kind of repeating the question you just answered, but there's a kicker to it. So I'll, I'll ask it again. When the first iPhone reviews started to come in and some of them were less than favorable, how did you stay positive? And then the, the next part of the question, how did you resist the urge to contact the reviewers and tell them they were wrong? <laughs> well, Steve probably did that. <laughs> uh, I, I think he did. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was unconcerned by what the reviewers said. I knew I used it. I knew how great it was. It just was irrelevant what they thought because it was going to be a good product once people started using it. Yeah. Um, assuming you're currently using an iPhone, is there ever a time you shake your head at something? If so, what? Uh, that happens all the time. If you're a designer, if you care about design, uh, you can't you know, go through any part of your life without shaking your head and thinking that could have been done better. And I thought that for our design, even the first version, the second version, you're always making it better. Yeah. 
Um, Andy Rubin, creator of the Android, came out with an uh, essential phone a couple weeks ago. And th the question is, are you working on any new tech that you intend to announce soon? <laughs> uh, I, I'm doing a lot of things. I'm doing Broadway. I do a whole set of advising of different startups. Um, I am not currently building something myself yeah. along that line. Yeah. Okay. Um, as far as you know. Yes. <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll go with that. What does artificial reality have to do right in terms of design to appeal to you? Arti artificial reality? You're what? saying augmented reality? It says artificial reality. A well, that sounds it scary. That sounds like Black Mirror. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, uh, VR. I, th I, th I think there's VR and AR, so virtual reality, augmented reality. I think augmented reality is very interesting if there's a form factor that makes sense. If there's not, then it won't succeed. Um, but I think the, the idea uh, of, artif of augmented reality, yeah. uh, God, <laughs> that's stuck in my head. Um, is a really, really good one, uh, again, as long as it doesn't go all black mirror on us. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, there was a period like five or six years ago, or maybe longer, that skeuomorphic design was super controversial. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, <laughs> do you, I mean, what, what do you feel now about? A, I had never heard the term skeuomorphism until yeah. years after we built the iPhone. And the first time, I mean, that's a horrible word, isn't it? <laughs> like, it sounds like I had to look it up. or morphing something. It sounds unnatural. Yeah. It just sounds terrible. Yeah. Uh, when I look at good design, when I look for good design, I look for something which is uh, easy to use, approachable, friendly. You can use it without a manual. Uh, it's fun. If you look at the designs we did at Apple, um, we talked about photo-illustrative designs. We talked about metaphorical designs. Uh, and those were infused into the design sense of Apple by Steve Jobs since the original Mac, if not earlier. Yeah. The original Mac had a desktop and folders that looked very much like the desktop on which that Mac sat. Yeah. And so we used these, these design philosophies. Uh, it doesn't mean that we loved every single part of it. It doesn't mean I loved every single part of it. There's definitely things that I was less a fan of than others. Um, but we built these designs that, that worked. And how do we know they worked? I mean, you just had to watch people use it. I remember when we shipped the original iPad. And within a week or so, I, I got these two emails. And one was from this guy who had a two-year-old daughter. And he had bought a new iPad, and he loaded it up with a set of apps. And uh, for her, and then he videoed handing it to her and having used the iPad for the very first time. This is a two-year-old. She takes it and she looks and she slides to unlock because the UI told her what to do. It animated, it had a little knob. She knew exactly what to do. She slid to unlock, she didn't have to read it, she couldn't read. Uh, she went to the home screen, she flipped through a few home screens, tapped an icon, she like came up, started playing a game. So a two-year-old yeah. could use it. On the other side of that, the same week, I got uh, an email from this woman who was 99 and a half years old. Uh, she said she was in her 100th year. And she was this voracious reader. But about a decade earlier, she got uh, cataracts, and she couldn't read anymore. Uh, and she wasn't a candidate for whatever reason for surgery. And even if she got printed books with large text, she couldn't read it. So she, for a decade, hadn't been able to read. She used to love to type on her typewriter, and she'd write limericks but she had terrible arthritis and she couldn't type anymore. The day the iPad came out, her family bought her an iPad and loaded it up with books. In that first week, she read two novels for the first time in a decade because she could make it big enough and it was bright enough they could get through the cataracts and she could read. Because it was a touch screen, she could type on it, even with her arthritis, because she just had to tap, she didn't have to put pressure on it. So she wrote me this email with this limerick and the limerick described how this iPad had reconnected her in her 100th year to reading and writing. That's wonderful. We knew we were doing something right with the user interface design. The team was amazing. We knew we were doing something right. Yeah. There are other good questions, but we're, we're running late, so we probably should... Before you... Should, okay. Let me say one last oh, thing. Which yes. Is, I mean, I'm sitting here earlier. There are three people. But when I look out here... Uh, there are so many people who 
are the ones who actually the heroes who made this happen. Like we had this hyper collaborative team of people who dedicated their lives for years to make this product a success. And it's not one person or four people. It was hundreds and thousands of people even uh, that made this happen. And so I'd like to applaud everyone here who is a part of it because you're really the ones who made it possible. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Thank you.